to, I mean, because when you're home, you still have all your responsibilities of being home. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you yeah. also don't really change. Uh, see, I, I still have to teach my classes and everything. And... <laughs> well, I have to feed my chickens and my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've still got three kids at home. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'm going to receive here everyone's personal descriptions. There's Surya. No, where's Surya? We have a, a change in the schedule relative to the original. I I think uh, Narendra is is speaking. Let's see. Yeah, it updated. Uh, let me just see. Updated thing we are putting in our website. Yeah. 24. Yeah. I was I was terrified that I was going to log in at the wrong time. Oh yeah. Oh I had it all worked out at nine o'clock Pacific time, but it's eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah. The fourth uh, the fourth talk is a change. Fourth talk in place of Dr. DS Pai, it will be uh, Dr. Narendra. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That is because of the I, request. I expect that the bio, you, you'll send me the other bio data for the others. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, so I've got. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll just uh, send it uh, by email to you right now. Okay. All right. So, Paul, it's 11 o'clock your time. Oh, yes. I am <laughs> usually going to sleep right around 10. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't dare take some coffee this time, though. Oh. Or anything like that. It's just tea. <laughs> yeah, so my email is open. Okay. Sending it into the chat works too. If you just send them one by one as they come. Okay, okay, okay. So first one is who's put up time says just sending it. Take one minute. I'm just getting a quick there's Ashrit Ragavendra. Okay. Cool. I think we're still, we still don't have all of our uh, speakers. Your address P A U L. Uh, I got it. P roundy at albany.edu, yes. but I'm also Paul P A U L here. Yes. I have just sent the first, first speaker bio. Okay, so I can start with Peter. Yeah, yeah, I, I, just, I, I will just uh, introduce you, then uh, you will start. Okay. I have sent it, last one. Did you get it? So, can I share my screen at some stage? Okay, yeah. Did you, yeah, I have sent it by mail. Oh. Okay, I think it just I think it just came in. So just let me get a hold of it here and and oh yes. So so I have uh, Peter's PowerPoint here, in addition. But but Peter, you can show your screen. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so should we start now? Yeah. Okay. Let me work out how to share a screen. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So once you once you share your screen, I'll read your your bio, and we'll give you an extra minute on the other side. Okay, so let us start it. I think. Okay. okay. So I'll just. Can you see my screen? Yes. Go ahead and share your screen, and Can you see we'll it now. Read, read your bio. All right. So good morning. So today, the third day of our IWM seven workshop. Now we have a invited speaker. Four speakers are there. So now may I request Professor Paul Irondi to chair the session. 
He is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences at the University of Albany in New York. He holds a PhD in Meteorology from Penn State University fr from 2003 and a Bachelor of Science in Physics. He enjoys studying the dynamics of the tropical atmosphere and its connections to the global atmosphere and ocean, specializing in analysis of large data sets in the context of the equation of motion. Over to Paul Rondi, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so this is uh, our first speaker is, is Peter John Webster, is currently Emeritus Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the United States. His main interests are in the physics of low frequency atmospheric and ocean oceanic dynamics and special interest in the structure and variability of the monsoon. His interest in monsoon stems from his involvement in the monsoon experiments 1979 to 80 following his graduation from MIT and subsequent tropical field investigations, EMEX, TOGA, TOGA Core, Jasmine, that he helped design, organize, and take part in the analysis of data. Webster's overriding interest has been in the advancement of science with the purpose of applying research results for the betterment of society, especially in the developing world. During the last decade, he has led efforts for the extended forecast on floods in the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Indus River systems and heat wave forecasts uh, in India. These forecasts aimed at extreme events were constructed in a probabilistic form and they're aimed at extreme events and were constructed in probabilistic form to allow users to make informed decisions and to take mitig mitigatory actions if necessary. More recently, he has concentrated in creating probabilistic forecasts for agricultural societies, especially in rain fed areas of, of the planet and the belief that useful forecasts delivered in under, understandable form will improve sustainability. Webster has written many papers on themes listed above and has recently published a book on the dynamics of tropical atmosphere and oceans. He's been recognized by a number of national and international prizes and awards. I will stop my video and and so Peter can begin. Okay, I have my screen sharing. Is that working? Not not yet. I'm not oh. seeing it yet. Oh, what do I do? Uh, we we can share from our end if it problem. You can't see it from your end. No, we can't see. Cannot see it. Oh. Well, I'm not quite sure what to do. Um, we, I guess we, I... We can say it from our end. Your PPT here, I think. Yeah. Okay, I guess you're from your end, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, what to do, what to do, what to do. Now it is said. Hmm? Yeah, it is said now. Can you see? Yes. I, I, you can see my screen? We can uh, see your presentation. Who has okay. shared uh, our, it is our, from our end or you have shared this screen? PowerPoint. Huh? Uh, we I, have I, shared I, from our end. Yeah, so this is now it is shared from our end. So please, uh, yeah, you will uh, click one by one. So you go ahead with your talk. Can you see the, that's the next slide, right? Uh, this is the first slide. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding. Uh, so as per instructions, we will move to the slides. Next. One okay. One. Uh, then, then um, go to the next slide, I guess. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid you're missing half my stuff, but never mind. Um, ah, okay. Um, can you hear me? Shall I start or give in or do what? Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, monsoon prediction across a number of scales and see if there's any progress on the horizons and what utility you might have from those. Um, next slide, please. No, nope. I'll try. Can you see the next slide? There we go. Hello, I, I'm, I'm becoming very confused. Are you seeing number two slide? Is it number? Yes. Uh, 
This is number two. Living in a world of variable weather and cl climate change. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I came across this. Um, Peter, you have stopped sharing, then these people are sharing actually. Yeah, you don't you share. Me. This is a shambles, guys. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I've no idea what to do. Uh, I've, got, I've got your picture on my screen. Uh, you don't hear me. I can't do anything. Can hear you. We can hear you. Can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, and we can see the slide. Okay. Uh, just tell I came, them when to move forward. Just. I came across this amazing quote by Silver, it says that one can prepare, one can strive, one can make a choice, but ultimately, life is an elaborate game of providence and probability. So providence is uh, normally a religious. Uh, thing, but uh, let's consider it to be nature. The, the providence can give you demonic or benevolent behavior. And what we need to do from that is determine the probability of adverse or clement weather and the occurrence of hazards, when, where, what amplitude, and what duration, and convey this information to users in a manner that is useful. But having said that, we have to ask can we produce? forecasts that are fit for purpose. And I'll explain later on what fit for purpose means. Are they useful forecasts? Uh, next slide, please. No. Oh. Can you see my third slide? Yes. So uh, one of the problems we have is that we've broached this thing called the valley of death, where new mythologies, results, and good intentions are from Paris. We have, on one side, people producing uh, basic research, innovation, and so on. On the other side, we have users who want to use a forecast. But quite often, the two don't meet. So somehow, we have to keep the innovations from falling into this <laughs> peculiar valley of death. Uh, next slide, please. So it's normally we think in terms of prediction, in terms of a hazard perspective, you know, how bad are things going to be? But really, we have to consider the full gamut of weather. When you think that in the developing world, 68% of the uh, uses rain-fed, non-irrigated farming practices. And globally, it's about 80%. So uh, forecasts of 1 to 15, 30 days are of critical importance, and they need to be communicated and implemented. What we know that we've showed that uh, uh, hazard forecasting we can do quite well, but that's not all people want to know. So uh, the goal of usable interseasonal forecasts remains elusive, and we need some uh, improvement in seasonal forecasts, which I'll come back to later. Uh, seasonal interannual forecasts are limited in accuracy, and, and they're li limited confidence or utility. Next slide, please. So. What does exist is a rather haphazard, overlapping, multi-tiered prediction scheme. And uh, uh, <clears throat> today we have short-term forecasts, 1 to 15 days. Uh, they're, they're in practice and they're okay. Interseasonal forecasts, 15 to 30 days. They're tactical, but possible. Uh, seasonal forecasts, they're strategic, but lots of problems. This is a cadal. Hey, let's talk about that later. <clears throat> so what we want to do is produce a forecast system that is useful, understandable, and transmittable to a user community. And um, this will allow us to assess, in other words, are these things fit for purpose? We look at those uh, <coughs> things in the, in the yellow thing. Are they useful for the general public? Next slide, please. So what we want to do on the top box here, we want to, we, we, we have a probability distribution of forecasts. It might be for heavy rain, 20% uh, and for light rain, 30% and no rain, 10%. Um, a unit, user community knows what to do with those forecasts. Uh, they know when to plant, when not to plant, when to avoid hazards and so on. So what we need to do is combine those two in order to give a, a forecast that combines what the, the farmer needs or the user needs with a probabilistic forecast to come up with a system of agri-risk. Agri 
So we have a, in the next slide, you might say that uh, a, a viewpoint is sustainability through hazard anticipation and mitigation. And the reason we do this is for providing uh, farmers and uh, users uh, information they can use right now. But we're of the belief that a society that learns to deal with present era hazards will be best equipped to adapt to and reduce the impacts of more frequent and intense habit, uh, hazards that may be encountered in a, in a changing climate. By the way, uh, <clears throat> the acronym for this is SHAZAM, which is uh, a metapeer for rolling thunder. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give three examples of short-term forecasting, where we stand. Uh, I'll give one to 14-day probabilistic precipitation forecasts for Central India, uh, uh, flood hazards in Bangladesh and Pakistan. I'll introduce a new metric called the Extreme Forecast Index, which is put out routinely by Eastern WF. I think all uh, probabilistic forecast producers, India, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Bangkok can, can use these. The, 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 the website is down below. Next slide, please. This is a probabilistic rainfall forecast that lags two, five, eight, and 11 days, 14 days, based on the Eastern WF ensemble forecast. The map on the right hand side, upper corner, shows you the area that we've, we've chosen. The first uh, graph is a rainfall observed. Uh, from June the 17th, which turned out to be the onset of the monsoon, all the way through to August. And below, you can see the, the forecast for lag of two days, five days, eight days, 11 days, and 14 days. And as you look down, uh, the two-day forecast, the five, eight, 11, and 14, all pick up the peaks. They also pick up the valleys. So the the, the forecasting system at all the way out to 14 days is picking up the periods of, of no rain and picking up the periods of maximum rain. Now, this is just a raw forecast. They haven't been calibrated using statistical techniques that we normally use. So I can briefly say that we can forecast quite well and tell a user that there's a high probability or a low probability out to 14 days of a dry period, for example, or a peak in precipitation. So this is, I think, useful information. <clears throat> the, the, um, this forecast fits the purpose of allowing a user to be able to uh, decide on what he or she wants to do. Next slide, please. These are the 14-day, 10-day forecasts we did for using the Eastern WF um, ensemble forecast for the Brahmaputra. And uh, we've done this for many years now. And what it shows, this is the dashed line, horizontal line, is the um, uh, flood level. And you can see that we have a, a, a swath of ensembles around the black line, which is observed. And so there's a high probability of precipitation and therefore flooding. This is also a hydrological model uh, during this period of flooding. So this was very, very useful for the for the uh, uh, farming community in Bangladesh is now a routine product that we produce <coughs> in conjunction with rhymes uh, for Bangladesh. Next slide, please. Uh, and, uh, you know, were, were these forecasts useful? Was the concept of probability understood by people who uh, you might not expect? <coughs> this is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a meeting we had, which was a uh, a summary of, of the 2008 floods. And this guy is an imam from, from a, a union in, in Bangladesh. And uh, he said that we disseminate the forecast information through the flag and pillar, that, that they use a, a communication if there's going to be a flood or heavy rain, flags are hoisted on that. They, they, they read the flag and pillar to understand the risk during prayer time. In my field, uh, was at seedling and transplantation. So I used the flood forecast information for harvesting crops and making decisions for seedling and transplantation. Unless also we saved household assets, and these are the uh, the, the 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 savings that these flood forecasts did. 
rather than the flood arriving and walking, working, uh, wiping out everything, they could uh, alter their fisheries, their agriculture, their livestock and household. Uh, there, there, there's some beautiful pictures I don't have here of, of uh, livestock being moved to higher ground and that's therefore saved. Normally they were drier, so uh, people believe the forecasts that they were useful. Uh, next, please. Uh, the Pakistan probabilistic forecast we did for 2010, 2012, you may remember that was a terrible period, three years of consecutive floods. So what we have in the ordinate here um, is the uh, uh, lag, and each of these is a plume of probabilistic forecasts uh, uh, relative to climatology. And you can see that there is plumes and the, the observations of these blue curves here along the axis. And you can see that there, there are 10, 14 day uh, uh, warnings of, of heavy, heavy rain. And each one of those plumes finishes up with the observed blue curve on, along the axis. So I think this is showing very, very well that uh, probabilistic short-term forecasts are doing particularly well. They fit for purpose. Next slide, please. And also, not just rain. This is the probabilistic heat wave forecast for Ahmedabad. And uh, they show uh, here we have lags on the ordinate again. This is for the temperature greater than 43 degrees C. And you can see that, again, we have these plumes relative to the blue curve, which is observations. So lots of warning. And they also picked out greater than 45 degrees on the bottom curve there. So we're doing quite well. Now this term, this EFI is the, um, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, a map of exceedance of climatology uh, in the period uh, greater than 90% of, of uh, climatology, way bigger than climatology. And you can see that here in India, this is Manabad here in the yellow dot, and all around it, they're expecting uh, 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 five days in advance, enormously warm temperatures. So there are tools that we can use, which are quite useful. Next slide, please. Uh, the Yucatran flooding, June 13th, uh, uh, the, on the left-hand side is the plume showing eight days in advance relative to the blue curve uh, that it was, could have been forecast very, very well. Uh, seven days in advance. And on the right-hand side are the, uh, the EFIs uh, indicating uh, an extreme precipitation. And you can see as we get advanced in time, six days, five days, three days, that Yucatan, which is the two bl black areas here, the two states, uh, uh, were warned for extreme precipitation. Next slide, please. So, I think in, the, in, in terms of the 1 to 14 days, if one is prepared to think in terms of probability and communicate the probability to the user, we're doing very, very well. Less so with seasonal forecasting of the monsoon. This next slide uh, shows the uh, uh, relationship of the uh, ARI with the contemporaneous El Nino Southern Isolation Index. So when you look at uh, below average, above average, deficient or, or heavy, it shows that uh, most deficient El Ninos are associated with El Nino and uh, uh, most heavy, uh, uh, it's greater than one standard deviation over the All India Rainfall Index, which is all of India, uh, it's <coughs> occurring with seven. <coughs> so the trouble is that's a contemporaneous El Nino. Uh, when you look at the rainfall and then you check contemporaneous, and so you find that um, there's a strong relationship. The trouble is, do we know what El Nino is going to be in advance so that we can forecast for India or wherever uh, there is going to be a deficient rainfall? Next slide, please. This just shows you the waveless analyses of, of Nino 3, SST and ALR, and there are two things to note here. And uh, uh, more importantly are those uh, spectra uh, to the second column and one shows a maximum three to four years and a monsoon rainfall two to three years. It's quasi, quasi biennial. So um, there's some interesting information here 
But the thing to note is that uh, during the 1930s to 1960s, the original correlations of the SOI, Southern Oscillation Index, and the Indian monsoon rainfall just decreased. So there was a 20 year period where there was no relationship whatsoever. It's called uh, the, what I call the Norman Troop uh, minimum. Next slide, uh, which shows you the co-variability of monsoon and ENSO. And uh, uh, the correlation is strong, but it's now over a much broader period, two to eight years, uh, rather than the two to three years. But you know, the interesting thing about the monsoon spectrum, there's a strong uh, biennial uh, uh, oscillation. And where does that come from? It'll give us a big clue for what's happened. Next, please. One of the problems was that when you know the SOI in June, July, and August, it correlates with the SOI in the next uh, December, January, and February at about 0.8. That's very strong. However, the December, January, and February SOI is, is a zero correlation with the June, July, August. And of course, the SOI for June, July, August is the thing we want because that tells us if the monsoon is going to be strong or weak. Uh, the graph on the right hand side shows you this demise of correlations as you move through. And uh, there's no correlation between uh, what's happening in the uh, one side of spring and the other side of spring. And it's sort of devastating in a sense, because it means that if you know what the SOA is, you get a good forecast, but if you don't know it in advance, you have no forecast. Next slide, please. And uh, these, are, these are regressional analyses. And, uh, a bit difficult to without a long explanation. But this is a regression of the December, January, uh, November, December, January, Nino 3 onto the SOT and the ARI. What it shows is that um, weak monsoon occurs four months prior to the Nino 3 SOT maximum. Noticing that before that table I showed, showed a contemporaneous. So in other words, um, we're not getting much information from the contemporaneous SOI. And this is a, a regression of a Nino 3 on the ARI, and the uh, maximum strong monsoon occurs four months before the Nino maximum. So in other words, uh, what we're seeing in a sense is that the regression analysis tends to support the conclusions of Norman, Norman which is that um, the, the, the monsoon is more of a broadcaster rather than something that is uh, um, the result of ENSO. So the question might be, is the variability of the monsoon causing variability of ENSO? And this is an interesting thing because... Um, uh, <clears throat> we need to start wrapping up. Oh my God, already? I've only been out about 10 seconds. <laughs> Anyhow, well, it doesn't matter. The Indian monsoon stands out as an active, not a passive feature in the world weather, more of a broadcasting tool. So Walker's analysis offered promise but for other regions rather than India. Um, uh, if I've only got a tiny, this is why we don't see any correlations. It's by a guy called Hofstadler. So let's forget that. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that we have a riddle, which is the Enso monsoon pretzel. And uh, uh, we're not quite sure where the, uh, the pretzel starts and where it finishes. But monsoon and Enso are indelibly connected. So it's not just a simple idea of if we, if we know Enso, we know um, the monsoon. Or if we know the monsoon, we know Enso. It's rather complicated. All right. So, uh, and also, and I'll end at this. Uh, if we knew perfectly uh, what the, uh, the if we had a perfect ARI forecast, uh, do we know the regional seasonal monsoon? Can we tell somebody in Uttar Pradesh that's going to be a weak monsoon? Therefore, you'll have stronger wheat. And uh, these are just a number of years. These, are, these, these, these top ones are for very strong monsoons, the bottom ones are weak monsoons. What you see is a patchwork of above average and below average. And so um, knowing that the monsoon is going to be strong doesn't tell you that central India is going to have way, way below. 
So we need to think of different ways of forecasting the monsoon. Um, I, I, am I out of time because um, uh, I think what we can do for questions is put them in, they can put them in the chat and you should go down and read the bottom of the chat so you can respond to any questions that come in yeah. so we can move forward. Yeah. And I'll, I'll shorten my talk just a little bit and, and I think we can try to, um, I think the last part can go a little bit later. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, why do we have strong and weak monsoons? And it's not because of ENSO, it's because of the Indian Ocean. And uh, uh, one of the things about the Indian Ocean is that uh, uh, the transport of uh, heat by the ocean and transport of heat by the atmosphere are out of, uh, completely out of phase. And the interesting thing to notice at the time, I would tell you that the transport of the Indian Ocean precedes a strong and weak monsoon. So finally, um, <laughs> these are the, uh, the annual anomalies of meridional heat transport on the top of the right. And uh, you can see uh, is every two years we get strong northward, strong southward, strong northward, strong southward. And so this leads us to why we get strong and weak monsoons. And it's next two slides and I'll stop here. <clears throat> so a strong and weak monsoon, uh, a strong monsoon will cause you uh, a, a strong southward transport of heat uh, by the oceans, by Eggman transports. A weak monsoon will be weak. So you go oscillate back and forward biennially. And this mm -hmm. impacts the, the monsoon precipitation uh, completely. So uh, you can't forecast the monsoon by considering ENSO alone. You have to take into account the other aspects of the, the Indian Ocean becomes enormously important. So um, that's about it. I, I've, you know. <laughs> Interesting, Peter. Yeah, so anyone with questions, put them in the chat and so Peter can respond to you there and we have to move on. Um, when I, I hope to be able to talk to you about some of this, actually, um, it won't happen today, but, yeah. but uh, I'd like to visit with you about it. There is Very a question in the chat box. There is a question in the chat box. I'm sorry. There is a question in the chat box to Dr. Peter. Can I read it? Uh, Peter can't understand you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there is a question for you. So you can find your questions in the chat and respond to them privately there. So I can sure. do my talk. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm going to try to wrap up um, before 1140. I'm looking at my time, but 15 minutes uh, from now. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Anyhow, anybody that can view my, um, <laughs> my presentation if they want. They have access to that, don't they? Okay. Can everyone see my, my presentation? Yes, yes, we can see. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So we're looking at uh, subseasonal variability associated with the monsoon, the connection between that subseasonal variability and the extra tropics, and considering both equatorial Rossby waves and the Madden Julian oscillation. So it's broadly known, I think, in this group that the MJO and other subseasonal modulations impact eastward and poleward propagating break and active periods in monsoon regions. We also have seasonally modified equatorial Rossby waves that modulate westward and poleward moving break in active regions. And these equatorial Rossby waves and the MJO can correlate with each other as, as, as well as have independent variants. <clears throat> Extratropical Rossby wave breaking is a major player relevant to both the impacts of the MJO and the equatorial Rossby waves on monsoons. <clears throat> now, Get this thing out of the way here. Uh, so we're mostly familiar, I think, with Jen and Hoskins um, result where they put a heat source here on the dateline along the equator, and it produces this overturning circulation in the zonal wind along the equator. And in addition to that, 
there is, let's see if I can get back here. So yes, um, in addition to that, the heat source produces a, a, a barotropic uh, Rossby wave response that radiates around, especially through the winter hemisphere. In this case, the northern hemisphere is considered the winter and a wave train also extending into the summer hemisphere. <clears throat> For the, the illustration I'm going to show you just now, we're going to focus on northern winter, uh, and then and then we'll move on to northern summer events. Uh, we're going to identify MJO events that include Central Pacific Rossby wave breaking near Hawaii when MJO convection is is over the eastern Indian Ocean, and we're going to compare the progression of events of those MJO events that have the Rossby wave breaking near Hawaii and the events that don't. This is from McCritchie and Roundy 2016. In order to uh, get the background understanding we're looking for here, I'm showing you a map of potential temperature on the tropopause during northern winter. Uh, we can see where the subtropical jet comes through here in the northern periphery of this high potential temperature region of the tropics. And then um, the Rossby waves that propagate uh, around the world um, will propagate linearly in the regions of strong gradients, and then they will break. So you re a region of strong gradients right here, east of Asia and east of North America. Uh, but then as the waves propagate farther to the east, the gradient weakens, and it is in these regions where the waves tend to break. So you imagine MJO convection here yields a response on the jet and then breaking waves downstream. And here is Figure nine from Moore et al. 2010, showing how the MJO induces anticyclonic and cyclonic Rossby wave breaking. Um, we have here in the top figure MJO over the eastern Indian Ocean, acceleration on the jet, and wave breaking through the central Pacific, initiating convection in the equatorial region here. Um, as the convection progresses over the Pacific, the Rossby wave breaking extends to the east as the jet extends with wave breaking into the tropics relevant to convection of the East Pacific at that time. And this is also a, a mechanism whereby uh, potential vorticity tails drop into the tropics and break off and become equatorial Rossby waves that then propagate to the west. So here is from McCritchie and Roundy 2016 from the Quarterly Journal showing two different MJO, con MJO conditions with the active convection shown in the blue shades over the eastern Indian Ocean here and here with the suppressed convection at the same time over the western Pacific. The MJO convection leads to a Rossby wave response downstream and a ridge over the North Pacific. Advection around the ridge here brings high potential vorticity air from the extratropics down breaks off these cutoff cyclones that become the cyclonic gyres associated with the MJO, or they reinforce those cyclonic gyres. While the events that don't have Rossby wave breaking near Hawaii lack the same gyre pattern. So I'm going to reconstruct for you a set of generalized northern summer and northern winter uh, Northern summer MJO and northern summer and northern winter equatorial Rossby wave cycles. We're going to follow the uh, result from or the method of Roundy 2017, which is the method of seasonally varying regression slope coefficients. This method allows us to diagnose global atmospheric circulation patterns associated with MJO indices as a continuous function of the seasonal cycle. So you can diagnose the relationship between the MJO and the tropics and signals in any part of the world as a continuous function of the seasonal cycle. The results here for the MJO are based on the RMM index of Wheeler and Hendon. And for the equatorial Rossby wave, we're looking at the first two principal components of Rossby filtered outgoing long wave radiation anomaly. So this is the um, We'll call it the phase one, just moving to the Indian Ocean. Active phase of the MJO centered around August 9th. And we see active convection in the blue shade stretched across the Western Hemisphere and amplifying over the Eastern Indian Ocean with suppressed convection over here 
moving northward and eastward over Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, correlated with this geopotential height anomaly pattern across the Northern Hemisphere. And we're going to march forward through this, watching the convection march forward and eastward. And at the same time, I don't have enough time to go back to the ones I was going to show here, but let's just look at this ridge pattern over the over northeastern Asia. Um, leading up to this pattern um, was a stronger ridge farther to the north, bringing down high potential vorticity air and dropping the cutoff cyclone into the tropics here, forming a block. And this trough modulates the outflow from the convection here across Southeast Asia and the Northwestern Pacific. And then the convection continues northward and finally damps out. <laughs> now, Wang and Shi in 1997 in, in Journal of Atmospheric Sciences showed one mechanism of the Northern Hemisphere summer MJO is eastward propagation of the MJO convection along the equator and then with equatorial Rossby waves shed westward from the Pacific MJO, then impacting uh, the Southern Asian monsoon. I'm also going to show that such equatorial Rossby waves can also emerge due to tropical, extratropical interaction. So this is our equatorial Rossby wave theoretical pattern. We have a pair of twin ridges and twin troughs. Um, the poleward advection of low potential vorticity air uh, here be west of the ridges leads to spinning up the ridges to the west of the present centers and you get westward propagation as a Rossby wave. <clears throat> now we're looking at a northern winter equatorial Rossby wave signal. You can see associated with it the twin ridges and troughs near the maritime continent in Southeast Asia. Um, but the key information I want to I want to look at first is this ridge over the Northeast Pacific. This ridge, wa Rossby wave breaking around this ridge, brings these cutoff cyclones into the tropics here, and this then backs to the west and develops as the equatorial Rossby wave train that then approaches the Indian Ocean. So the principal source here is very interesting. You can have convection over the Indian Ocean here, yielding a wave train response that builds the ridge over the North Pacific, and then that same ridge over the North Pacific drops the troughs on its equatorward side due to Rossby wave breaking. Now, during northern summer, it's somewhat different. Um, I want to focus first on the convection, looking here over of the eastern Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia, and then we'll look, at, look over the East Pacific again for the precursor patterns. So marching forward, um, phase one, two, three, four, we see these westward and northward moving active region over the uh, Indian Ocean moving into India, centered around the 30th of June. Um, notice there is a little bit of symmetry in the convective features here over the Pacific, but <clears throat> these features are more centered in the Northern Hemisphere, just like Ben Wong had previously shown. Backing up again, <clears throat> when the convection associated with the Rossby wave is over the Indian Ocean here, there is <clears throat> a ridge over the Northeast Pacific, which draws down as I described before, the high potential vorticity air organizing the trough on its equatorward side, which then <clears throat> organizes and propagates westward. You can see it here, it moved all the way around the ridge and then propagates farther westward over Southern Asia. And this is again, similar to this original paper from Bin Wong, uh, the active convection moving eastward along the equator and then by their assessment, backing to the west from here. Um, and I'm, I'm also seeing a center of action beginning over the Eastern Indian Ocean and moving northward and westward associated with this westward moving feature. And I assert that a principal cause of the observed westward moving waves here is wave breaking from the extra tropics. So my conclusions are the MJO and equatorial Rossby waves interact with extratropical Rossby wave breaking. 
A portion of eastward and northward components of the northern summer monsoon systems break in active cycles associate with the MJO. And westward and northward moving features associate with seasonally modified equatorial Rossby wave signals initiated by extratropical Rossby wave breaking. And um, so I, I can say we have uh, just a couple more minutes. Um, if I was supposed to be finishing at 1140, so we're shifting back just a couple minutes. If there are uh, one question or two questions, If I stop my share, I think I'll be able to see the chat. So I'm going to say stop sharing. Okay. Hey, Paul. Yes, please. It's Peter. I, I have a slightly different interpretation of, of uh, what produces the wave breaking. Sure. And, uh, I, I'll. Um, um, uh, in, in terms of potential vorticity transports, of course, the, the monsoon transport potential vorticity north produces the net jet stream at about 30, 40 degrees south. Yes. That becomes unstable as, as into a region of negative stretching deformation, the waves break, and they come back uh, towards the equator, and then they influence the monsoon, so you get a nice cycle. I'll send you a couple of chapters from my book, which might... Sure explain that. So I'm doing that right now. Okay. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, <laughs> Dr. Saria Chandra Rao. And you're welcome to begin showing your screen. Dr. Rao is a senior scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and is leading Mon Monsoon Mission Program of India as Associate Mission Director. Monsoon Mission is an ambitious mission mode program to improve the skill of Indian summer monsoon weather and climate. As a result of this program, India's dynamical model are now one of the better models among models from other leading centers. His work on Indian Ocean Dipole, Indian Ocean Warming, and Indian Ocean Monsoon Variability and Prediction were highly cited by peers. Dr. Rao has published around 100 research papers with high citations around 7,000. Impressive. And Leading international in leading international journals and received several awards nationally and internationally. At present, he is also serving as a member of the Clivar GUX Monsoons panel. His efforts as project director of high, of high performance computing is also responsible for establishing India's first multi, multi petaflops high performance computer. You're welcome to go into presentation mode. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning to everyone and some for someone good evening and others good afternoon. So today I will be talking about SST trends in the Bay of Bengal and uh, this the Bay of Bengal its impact on Indian summer monsoon trend fall. So there will be so many collaborators in this uh, work and some of the works have been already published. Some of them are communicated and some of them are under progress. <laughs> So we know that Western uh, boundary currents play a very important role in uh, controlling the climate. As you, we, uh, the good examples are Gulf Stream and Croatia extension and Croatia currents. So when it comes to Indian Ocean, particularly uh, North Indian Ocean, it is landlocked. So normally these Western boundary currents that when we talk about uh, in uh, Atlantic and uh, Pacific, they move all the way from equator to mid latitudes and to polar regions as well. Whereas in Indian Ocean, the land is uh, locked on the northern side. Uh, the Indian Ocean is locked by lands on the northern side. And at the same time, the current speeds of these western boundary currents, the Somalia and the East India coastal current, their speeds are much, much lower compared to uh, the speeds of this Gulf Stream and uh, Croatia current. So they are almost uh, five times less speed in the ocean. 
some background noise is there. That is some one of my things on. Yeah. So it is interesting to see whether such weak currents in the Indian Ocean can have any impact on the climate, particularly on the monsoon. That is what is today's talk is about. So if you look at Gulf Stream, Minobe et al. 2008 have published that if you smooth out these uh, SST fronts in the uh, Gulf Stream region, the rainfall simulated by AGCM is much, much smoother and you don't get such strong rainfall rain rates that you normally observe. So that means it clearly indicates that the SST front in the uh, Gulf Stream region is significantly impacting uh, monsoon uh, the rainfall over that region. Similarly, for Kuroshio region also, it modulates the, uh, this is a study by Yoshida et al. The late heat flux Kuroshio and its extension and has explosive cyclones and cause local and basin scale atmosphere response to the SST front. So both Gulf Stream and uh, Kuroshio have shown that there are many studies which have shown that it strongly impacts either the storm track in the uh, Pacific and the uh, Atlantic. So what happens in the Indian Ocean? when we are trying to look at uh, things which are changing seasonally as well. So uh, that is the basis of this today's talk. And Bay of Bengal, if you look at, uh, this is the Bay of Bengal uh, SST and uh, sea level anomalies. So both are shown here. They both <coughs> shows that very strong, rich eddy activity in both in these, both the fields both in sea level anomalies and also SSTs. So today's talk is trying to understand how these fronts in SST and these eddies will impact Indian monsoon. Okay, so this is another slide from Chennai Tal 2018, which shows the eddy kinetic energy centers in the Bay of Bengal. You can see that there are three regions where the eddy kinetic energy is much stronger. Most importantly, we are concentrating on the Western side of the Bay of Bengal. And this eddy structure is mainly due to the uh, coastal trap Kelvin waves traveling along the uh, peripheral of Bay of Bengal. So one of the major uh, rain bearing systems in the Bay of Bengal during monsoon season are low pressure systems. So if you look at a composite of uh, and the background state of this uh, Bay of Bengal during when uh, these things are forming, when the uh, low pressure systems are forming, what you notice is that this is a mixed layer depth and this is the SST, this is sea surface salinity uh, fields in the Bay of Bengal. So what you notice is that there is a strong front that is seen very clearly both in SST, mixed layer depth and also in the sea surface salinity. So it is uh, very uh, encouraging to assume that these fronts will play important role. So we'll see how this fronts will play important role in controlling or modulating these low pressure systems. So what is required for formation of low pressure systems in the Bay of Bengal is humid and convective unstable environment with high cyclone capacity and high sea surface temperature. That is what is most important. So all these fields are there, but one thing that uh, it's not, if these fronts are not available, not there in the Bay of Bengal, what happens to these low pressure systems? That is what we'll look at it. See, uh, in India, we have been using CFS coupled model for making forecasts and extended range and seasonal range time scales. And the atmosphere component, we are using it for making short range forecasts. One of the, uh, these are the SSTs in a low resolution model and high resolution bias of this and the difference between low resolution and high resolution. And this, these are the rainfall biases. So one noticeable uh, thing that you notice over India is that Almost all coupled models, including CFS, shows very strong dry bias over Indian landmass region. So that is the one of the problems that almost all coupled models face today. So is this uh, SST front has any role in controlling this? That is what we look at it in the following slides. So what we did is the, uh, we did some sensitive experiments using CFS model. It's simply what we did is that we just uh, removed 
ocean dynamics by describing a slab in different regions. Ice slab means in the ocean, there are no ocean dynamics, only slab model is there and the SST is calculated using simple bulk formulas. And P slab, first peak, the no ocean dynamics are there in this one. And in the control, all ocean dynamics are there. These are the observed parameters of SST and trend form. As I told you earlier, the control is see very clearly strong dry bias over Indian land region and cold SSTs in the North Indian Ocean region. When we uh, somehow uh, cut off the ocean dynamics, this dry bias over Indian land mass improves, means it decreases compared to the control run. And what we have noticed is that there is some structure that is coming very clearly in the Bay of Bengal is the warm SSTs are prop popping up very uh, clearly. Whereas in peace lab, the dry bias increases because you have a perennial like Elino in the first week and SSTs are cooler along the uh, this SST front. That is what is the reason. So the one thing that we have understood from these experiments is that if you have a warm SSTs in the northern Indian Ocean and some gradients are maintained, then definitely the prediction skill of these models will be as good as control run, even though there are no uh, ocean dynamics. So not much of ocean dynamics is playing a role, but the important thing is that the SSTs, which are very close to observations are important for giving that same internal variability. Whereas if you don't have peace slab, that is there's no specific dynamics, the scale drops significantly to 0.14. Whereas uh, between control and ice lab, you don't see much of difference. However, the internal variability drops significantly in the ice lab run. So this experiment has uh, given a confidence that yes, SSTs in the Bay of Bengal are very important for modulating the monsoon. So then we try to look at whether, uh, what is the reason for having a strong dry, uh, dry bias over Indian land region so we looked at the low pressure systems in the coupled model. And what we noticed is that in the control run, these low pressure systems don't propagate much in deeper into the Indian land mass. So that's why you have a strong dry bias in the uh, coupled model in the control run. Whereas in ice lab, because you have the SST gradients very clearly, so these low pressure systems propagate deeper into the Indian land mass and gives you more rainfall. And therefore the dry bias has reduced significantly. Whereas in peace lab, they don't even uh, move to the Indian land region. If here I am showing you the uh, different fields of humidity in different uh, RH and Q in uh, different runs, what you notice in reanalysis is that there is a strong uh, humidity front, not only SST front, even a humidity front is hugging the coast of Bengal, east, uh, western coast. So, whereas that is not seen in the control run, whereas I slab, you get some signal in the P slab, you don't get it. So, again, getting this humidity front is another important thing for getting the low pressure systems properly in the models. And it appears, not it appears, now it is, we are confident that without having this uh, front of SST, C surface salinity, and MLDs, we will not be able to get low pressure systems in the uh, couple model significantly propagating deep into the Indian land region. So, Hirata et al. have done a very uh, ex uh, good experiments by controlling latent heat flux and sensible heat flux in the uh, Gulf Stream region. And what they noticed is that they have used the Serres model, the cloud resolving storm simulator. And what they have noticed that when you red, suppress this latent heat flux and sensible heat flux in this region, the storm track moves away from the Gulf Stream region. So that is what is one thing they have noticed. And similarly, they have done a similar experiment in the Bay of Bengal, but unfortunately, they have considered the whole of Bay of Bengal to do the experiment. If they have restricted their uh, region only to the Western uh, Bay of Bengal, then things would have been different. Again, the, they come to the same conclusion. If there is no latent heat flux and sensible heat flux from the Bay of Bengal, the low pressure systems that are forming, the rapid development will not be there in the Bay of Bengal as well. So uh, we have done a experiment using WRF model by giving uh, mixed layer depth 
modulating the mixed layer depth and SSTs in that those regions. And what we have noticed is simply is that if this SST gradient is not there, the number of loop systems forming are very, very few in the Bay of Bengal. So once uh, this uh, downscaled high resolution WRF model coupled with uh, a slab ocean model is used, so we are able to get that SST front in the Bay of Bengal very clearly. So that is making us uh, confident that the SST front in the Bay of Bengal is very much important to get mean monsoon circulation correctly and the low pressure systems also correctly. Not only that, even the PDF of the rainfall in different regions, Bay of Bengal, Central India, and Arabian Sea and Equatorial Guinea improves significantly, particularly of Bay of Bengal and Central India improves significantly because of the SST front is simulated very well in the model. And the skill also improves in the model when you have that uh, SST front in the so now we started looking at whether the SST front alone or the eddies which are uh, prominent in the Bay of Bengal are causing this. So this is we have used uh, Okubo V's parameter to identify the eddy structure in the Bay of Bengal, and this is the OWJJ index, and you can see that the Western Bay of Bengal is very rich in eddy structure, and uh, this is the time series of that. If I take a time series of anticyclonic uh, index, uh, eddy index, and correlate with rainfall everywhere, what I notice is that the rainfall over Indian region is significantly enhanced. So whenever I have a strong anticyclonic activity in the uh, Western Bay of Bengal, the monsoon is getting strengthened uh, along the Western Ghats and also in the Central Indian region. So that is very interesting result. And whereas when you have a uh, cyclonic eddies in the same region, the monsoon rainfall decreases. Similarly, when the anticyclonic eddies are on the away from the uh, west or the east, then also the monsoon rainfall decreases. So we found a very strong correlation between this eddy structure that is happening in the Bay of Bengal, particularly in the western Bay of Bengal. So to conclude that, what we have done is we have uh, done two experiments, one is with control SST and SST smooth. These are the two, uh, this is the smoother one and this is the uh, control where the exact SSTs are given, the difference is here. You can see that the eddy structure is very strongly there in this uh, Bay of Bengal. So those eddies are removed. Once you remove those eddies, what will happen? So we have done, We have what we have done is that we have used GFS version 14 similar Grangian model with 0.125 degrees resolution with 64 vertical levels and selected two years, one is 2018 and another is 2018, uh, 19. So wherein the East Anticyclone Index is stronger in 2018 and West Anticyclone Cyclone is stronger in 2019. So as noticed earlier, in uh, 2019, when uh, the West Anticyclones Cyclones are there, the, the, we have noticed the decreased rainfall and uh, when Eastern, so this is opposite, sorry. So when you have a Western, and cyclones are stronger, then the rainfall has increased, and the eastern and cyclones are there, rainfall has decreased. So then we try to understand why this is happening. So and in fact, these eddies are modulating the wind speeds and the uh, advection and convergence. And therefore, what we have noticed is that when we carried out the March budget analysis, what we noticed is that in the both smooth and control runs, the difference observed in the precipitation was contributed dominantly by the convergence term and also followed by the advection. So these two terms are contributing to changing the rainfall over uh, Indian region. To summarize, so SST, ML and SST front along the east coast of India is an essential component of monsoon and for formation of local systems, it is very much required. And it is in the Bay of Bengal definitely modulating the direction and convergence of moisture budget significantly, thereby influencing the seasonal wind monsoon. So, Western Bay of Bengal anticyclones tend to increase monsoon rainfall, whereas Eastern Bay of Bengal anticyclones decrease. So, uh, other way is that if there are cyclonic eddies are there, then they also try to decrease the rainfall there. So, now the uh, questions remains is that how well, since all these models that we are using, uh, see for seasonal forecasting and forecasting, they are coarse resolution. The, at the maximum, we can go up to 38 kilometer at this moment. So how do we get this eddy structure correctly in these models? That is one of the questions that will be the future study. And how do we parameterize 
this at the active field to these models and how well we can represent uh, the SST friend. Why the SST friend is so important for low pressure systems to form and what other mechanisms are driving that. So with that, I conclude my thing. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Um, yeah, thank you. We're, we're still running a couple minutes late, um, I, but I, I think we've all pushed back a little bit. It, we're welcome. One quick question or put your questions into the chat so he can respond to you there. Okay, so we can introduce our final speaker. Looks like there are new messages coming in. So, Surya, just check down there for your questions. Yeah, I'm asking them. Thank you. All right. Okay, so let me find my way back. Just one moment. Okay, Dr. Narendra Tuteja has over 30 years of scientific and engineering experience in industry, applied research, and academia in hydrology, water resources, and natural resource management across Australia, Europe, and South Asia. Narendra has supported development of policies and decision-making in the water sector. He has guided development and delivery of operational water quality and, and quality forecasting services at short, medium, and extended range timescales in Australia. In his current role, he guides rural water supply and flood modeling work of water in New South Wales, which was a state-owned corporation and bulk water supplier in Australia. He has collaborated nationally and overseas and published peer-reviewed literature on, a wide on wide ranging topics in water and environment domains. He is a member of the Hydrology Coordination Panel of, of the World Meteorological Organization, Earth System Modeling and Prediction, and author of, of uh, other WMO works. I think this is missing, missing some portion here. Uh, there we go. So you're welcome to show your screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. And, and we can go through twelve twenty or through 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 uh, twenty five minutes after we twenty twenty minutes after we start. Thank you. And are you seeing the screen now? Yes. Okay. Sir, uh, the screen is split into two. Okay, so instead, yeah, yeah, just bear with me, please. Let me do it again. Forward now. Yes. Good. So while I'm talking, I'm actually not seeing you or the other screen. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, thanks very much for the introduction and the opportunity to talk about uh, the work that's been done in Australia and I guess more in internationally in cooperation with WMO partners. So I do want to acknowledge, and I won't go through all of these slides, but key in the contents of this slide, but I do want to draw upon a couple of things. Firstly, the work described here is largely developed uh, within the Australian sort of community of practice, led by the Bureau of Meteorology, CSRO, University sector. And there's also substantive work done with WMO partners. 
none of the work in the water industry can possibly be done without the industry partners. As you know, water users are absolutely critical. And some of those sentiments were captured in the earlier talk by Peter Webster. So, um, and a whole raft of those um, agencies who have been involved and are the many colleagues on this call from IMD, IOTM, and CMRWF who have been critical for, uh, I guess, uh, drawing upon their experiences on what needs to happen in different parts of the world. So that's the, uh, the outline of the talk that I'm going to go through in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so there, there's an overview of what work is being done on the WMO side through an initiative called Hydro SOS, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, as part of the WMO initiative, we've also done some evaluation about how do global models um, in the climate domain, and when you, you operate the water hydrology problem at a global scale, how does that compare with high resolution models where the local scale decisions are made? So some very sort of a, uh, quantitative assessments have been done and I'll share some of those perspectives. Um, I'll draw upon some of the work that's been done uh, in Australia around the development of services. I think uh, Peter Webster touched upon this a little bit in his talk. Um, there's a lot of work done around the globe on flood forecasting, but very little on what happens to water forecast beyond the flood time frame. So a lot of those services have been developed through the, the cooperative business model used in Australia, and I'll share some of those thoughts, uh, what's been done. Uh, I'm actually going to come to uh, the water sector needs and challenges and the pain points, and largely to use this opportunity with the climate community of practice that I see here to reflect upon that, um, you know, why it is important for us to think about the partnership model. And then I'll conclude some remarks from there. So what is Hydro SOS? It stands for Global Hydrological Status and Outlook System. Um, it's trying to do essentially moving the WMO footprint beyond the flood time frame through which typically has been done through an initiative called FFGS, so Flood Forecasting and Garden System, um, moving to uh, the, the system that actually could be owned by national meteorological and hydrological services and, and uh, delivered uh, regionally. So what's being tried there is really something that can assemble all the data together, which is by no means unlike climatology, a very difficult task for hydrology data to be, to be coordinated in, in such a cooperative way as the, the climate community does for a whole raft of reasons, political, technical, uh, bureaucratic, and, and uh, what, uh, what you may. So, so the, the aim is to really look at what is the current status? Um, is it um, near median or, or on the dry, towards the dry end or towards the wet end or wetter than normal? And, and how bad or good it's likely to be going forward? And the time scale of interest in Hydro SOS is really down to a week for tactical operational reasons and then to sub-seasonal kind of 30-day time scale when most of the resource assessments are done and then for bulk water planning thinking about somewhere in the stream uh, in the time scale of about three to six months and noting that the predictability and the skills go down quite drastically from there. So the Hydro SOS is not aiming to be uh, particularly prognostic to a particular model or modeling paradigm, rather how this system could be built ground up, basically leveraging the initiatives that are underway in various regions and various countries and various sort of national meteorological and hydrological services. So what Hydro SOS really intends to do is bring the hydrological data into a framework which could be broadly considered in the next five years in a Vygos kind of framework. Brought it into modeling paradigms that could be a synthesis of what happens in the GDPFS and bringing hydrology into earth system sciences, work with the community around how those products could be developed and disseminated. So there was a pilot phase, Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Basin was one of them, 
and the other was Lake Victoria in Australia. That concluded last year. And then at the last executive council, uh, there was an endorsement given for regional implementation in the next sort of four to five years. And, and then hopefully there's a lot of work to be done in this. So uh, I think the water community and the climate community need to work together quite well over the next couple of years for uh, if there is even 50% uh, of what is anticipated or, uh, or, or aspired can actually be achieved. Um, uh, we all know there's been a best practice guide on, on seasonal climate prediction. There's actually a seasonal hydrological prediction guideline that's been in the making and that's actually uh, been released only yesterday. Uh, and, and those links are available on the WMO website. Broadly, uh, there's a conceptual framework uh, to this audience. I think we don't need to talk too much about uh, what's the, the essential building blocks. But one thing I do want to point out, there is there is a there's a need for us to recognize that the high resolution models that can be based upon a framework presented here. There's also a belief in parts of the climate community that why can't we use directly the climate models and bring them into hydrology domain? So the question then is really, can we use them directly or we do need to have some additional built functionalities in, in the local system that we can work together? And the idea should be somehow we do a verification at the hydrologic scale uh, at those three times that we're talking about. So that brings me to, and I don't want to talk too much about this slide except to make one point. That is, uh, the all the work that the climate community talks about, really, the climate systems are very co uh, chaotic, very difficult, and very complex. And we've seen some of the illustrations from, from, from the talks earlier today, uh, how complex they can be in the scale. But there's one benefit that hydrology community has is really the role of initial hydrological conditions. So uh, it does take a fair bit of time for at least the systems with larger storage to filter through that. So, so at least part of the predictability in the next sort of three to five to seven days to a week or even sometime to a month can come depending on the, the hydrogeomorphic characteristics of the catchments that we're dealing with in various parts of the world, uh, a lot of uh, skills from there could be leveraged as well. So I think the, the climate predictions adds to the additional skill that comes from hydrologic skills. And, and there's work done in various parts of the world, how much of predictability comes from the initial hydrological conditions versus uh, the, the, the climate predictability. What I'm going to go to next is a systematic study that we did uh, as part of the Hydro SOS initiative. There are 30 catchments in various sort of tropical areas, mid latitude, and also sort of mild and temperate areas in the south, and compared those catchment scale forecasts and catchment scale simulations and catchment scale observations from global models and the local models. So the global model, and there's a paper that's going out to haste basically this month, uh, sorry, next month actually, um, and, and that quantifies some of those challenges that we saw. Uh, so these catchments, what I show here is the months on the horizontal axis, uh, and each of this dot is a dot that corresponds to these areas here. So there are about 30 odd catchments, and you can see this is the forcing the global model with the reanalysis data set to bring in the hydrology at a catchment, which can be somewhere in the 1,000 square kilometer to 5,000 square kilometer scale. When you do that, the, the biases that you get, the, the, the biases basically, the, both the negative and the positive biases are shown here, and you can see quite clearly that the reanalysis data sets from global models at the hydrologic scale is seriously biased. And therefore, there is something that we need to think about when we think of reanalysis products and, 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 and how we actually measure the uh, efficacy of those products for hydrological application. And that has a flow on effect. So one of the things that we all found from that was there are A, large biases, and generally, 
underestimation in wet seasons and overestimation in dry seasons, uh, which could be uh, a systematic one, in, but in some cases, there were unsystematic biases as well. And then you start questioning when you verify the global models with reanalysis data sets and the, the local scale models are actually verified with observations. So there's a distinction that we need to bear in mind. And the next thing we show is obviously the water industry is risk averse. It needs that uh, reliable predictions. And what we are showing here really is the, the one month forecast coming from a local model and from a global model. Uh, it's not important to focus on the model, which models here. The, the key message is very similar when you look at the different models across the two scales. The first thing you clearly see is the local models, they are generally far more reliable than the global models. The other thing this paper finds out is that the, the, the global models tend to give sharper forecasts than the local models. And that's not very uncommon because they're too emphatic and often too wrong. The third thing is the accuracy and the accuracy that we expressed in, in the quantified CRPS, we find very similar things that the accuracy is larger, largely much, much skewed to the local models than the global models. So I want to come to uh, some of the things that have been done in the services development and these services were developed over the last 10 years. A fair bit of money has gone into this and a whole lot of products that have been developed. What we figured out from that experience is firstly, the operational agency and the research agencies had to really glue together into a formal governance arrangement where we could transfer the technologies from research agencies to operational agencies. And then the, the agencies also had to work with the water operators on how they want different products. I'm not going to go through these products, but each of those products have been developed after hundreds of consultations across the, across the industry, across the country. And one thing that stands out was that A, you need products more in a way that agencies can use them. So it's not just enough to give the numbers, give the graphics, give the context. And then the second thing is the verification. And those verifications may not be always very scientifically uh, conditioned. The science can sit behind, but you can basically color code. Green is good, purple is bad, traffic light type of concept to be used. So that's a seven day forecast that's available uh, in Australia every day now uh, through an automated system. Similarly, there's a seasonal system that's underway. It gives basically to granular products at the sort of a local level, what's next 30 days, what's next 60 days, what's 90 days going to look like. How does it look like at a particular site as an example? How does it look like across the country as a whole? What is the skill of a curve, sort of a, this particular site across various months uh, in the hindcast? How does the forecast go over the last 12 months? So there's a lot of work done underneath for this. Uh, I can see I'm rushing now to to few pain points. So I guess one of the drivers that I moved from the Bureau of Meteorology to a water operator agency is because to influence decision making, you really get to be inside the tent. And these are some of the priorities that I say coming from the water operators. There are flood operations that we need. We need to manage airspace and dams. We need to deliver water to various parts of the valleys. And there is a need for demand forecasting out to a season to a year. There's a need to account for inflows to dams. And many of these dams are highly regulated. There's a question around water security planning and the climate change impact. So there are some of the needs that we need to support through various applications. Not everything can be done through sub-seasonal to seasonal scale, but there's a lot of this area of demands actually is on sub-seasonal to seasonal scale forecasting. The next point I want to make is how does the concept really work? What matters? Why is it that we need forecasts? So the first thing is the agencies, uh, and there's got to be a system of rules and in the valley, people have got access licenses. Uh, the, the, there are water sharing plants and how the water is to be shared amongst various users, be it consumptive users, be it environment. And then 
each shareholder of the water has got to have some say in the accounting. And the accounting is managed basically through a regulator who manages who has got what much license to share the water, to share the water and how much that person is taking or is allowed to take. The next thing we need is the storage. How much of water we have in our infrastructure that we can use to carry through the water year, for example. What are the impounding structure? What is the near real-time storage in this? The next thing is water availability changes based on drought, droughts and wet cycles or dry and wet cycles. So there are categories. There are high security water categories, low security water categories. There are human consumption, there's stock and domestic. There are a whole lot of things that you need to think. And all of those accounting rules need to account for each of those categories in a very structured way. The next bit is in Australia, the water rights basically and land rights are separate. So you can order, you can sell water temporarily or permanently. This is something like four to five billion dollar trade annually. And, and the availability of water dictates the price. It could go from anywhere around, uh, let's say hundred dollars, uh, a thousand cubic meter to something of the order of about three thousand uh, dollars a thousand cubic meter. So that's the range and it, it basically that trade can be quite a lot. Um, and therefore we need to pay attention. So the next thing is the orders. So every day the river operator gets the orders. Uh, the every account holder orders, I'm going to need water for such and such time and I need access to that water. And, and those orders are ag aggregated and they go down up to the storage level. And the last thing that the aggregator needs to, the, the uh, operator needs to know is what is the aggregated demand across the valley? Then comes how much water I've got available. I need to know what is the forecast, both of the inflow to the dams and the tributaries that are downstream of the dam. So that's why that zero to 30 days and zero to 90 days is important. Uh, many of these valleys will have up to six to eight weeks of travel time, and you need to know how much water you need to release, accounting for the transmission losses. So all of this requires forecasting at the subseasonal to seasonal time scale, which is absolutely critical. The other point I want to make, uh, and and I'll end uh, very quickly, David. Just uh, give me a moment here. So this is, for example, a very important storage in one part of Australia. What it's showing is this time scale, if you look at carefully, roughly about four years. Every four years, we are seeing the sort of wetting drying cycle. So what the operator needs to do is A, managing the infrastructure safety and the people safety also ensure when you get high flows, you basically get your storage back to a level which is almost full across all the impounding that you can do in your valley, assuming today is the start of a multi-year drought. And that's really, really critical. And then we can support all of those needs that the, with the whole lot of rules and principles. So you can see it's a very complex business and there are pain points. First, there are many, many forecast products that you look at in which parts of the GDPFS centers are there. There's very little guidance which forecast product we should use. Who is going to look after dealing with the biases that I illustrated around that? How do water sector get access to the NWP data? And these are the questions that we are putting up as hydrology community to the climate community to infrastructure commission and the services commission. And I want to end with this sort of a, this thing that there's clarity needed on what forecast product to be used, not just clarity on what to use, but also rationale, whether it is fit for purpose. Access to NWP data is an important issue. The National Meteorology and Hydrology Agencies, in the case of India, for instance, IMD and, and, and CWC, need to work hand in glove with IITM and CMRWF and NIH. So that enterprise approach around working with the users, what needs are, understanding that there's a role, there's a need for global models because high resolution models cannot be everywhere and there's a need for catchment models. 
Verification, we often talk of verification, but we mean very different things. So verification is important really to enhance end user confidence. And for that, it's not always the scientific metrics where that matter, it's always to getting the, the users inside the tent through intuitive products. And now the, the other point I want to make is the production of services are important. There are works underway in the hydrology domain, different regions of WMO are at different levels of advancement. But there's, I think, one thing that we should not forget. Water operators have contingent liabilities. We cannot release water unless we basically either disturb the chemistry of the water sharing uh, between users or alternatively have unwarranted flooding. So those tension points means the use of this publicistic information need to be in a, such a way that we actually have compelling reasons to take decisions which are optimal. Uh, forecasts will always be imperfect, but how to make use of imperfect forecasts uh, in, the, in the words of Kurupa Kumar Kali to basically make optimal decision making. And I'll stop here. Thank you, David. This is fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we've reached the end of our of our allotted time. I hope that the administrators can keep it, the chat open for a few more minutes so that there can be some conversation about the latest talk. Um, otherwise, I, I I think we've come to a close. I want to thank all of the distinguished speakers today and for everyone's all the participation from the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So you do have some questions there in the in the chat. Yeah, I didn't in. know. Only comment there from Dr. Peter to Narendra. So it'd be very nice. There is no question here, sir. <clears throat> so thank you very much uh, to chair and all the our speakers for uh, maintaining the time. So I must thank Dr. Paul for, uh, yes, we have maintained time and also very excellent for talk. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. And uh, we'll be back in five minutes from now for the parallel session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Huh? Yeah. Now, now we are just opening hall B. Okay. Okay. Uh, you just uh, I I'm sending now again. Uh, use go to hall B. Okay. Just I am sending. जस्ट क्लिक PDF, PDF, PDF open. Is there one, two files are there? No, no, one is PDF, sir. Just see. Hey, doc, doc, why not we link? Doc, doc also link. Okay, B, B, yeah, fine.
खबर अभी यू कनेक्टेड टू हॉल ए और हॉल बी हॉल बी हेलो हेलो आरएफटी मैन ऑन पेपर एंड शी सेड पेपर साइड या ओके सर So, Dimitri sir, are you there? Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Patnaik. Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning to yes. all of you. So now we'll be starting the parallel session in Hall A. Today is twenty-fifth, uh, third day of our workshop. So we have very distinguished uh, scientists, Professor A. P. Dimitri, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and uh, as you know, I just. Uh, Like to introduce very brief introduce. So he did a lot of work on western disturbances, winter monsoon, and got various awards and recognition. So without wasting much time, now I request Professor Ap Dimri to kindly coordinate the session. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik, for kind words. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, we are here in the parallel session of modeling. monsoon processes monsoon is very key for us and hence the its modeling and understanding the process and dynamics in the changing time so we have very important uh, six talks in this session scheduled and as stated we have roughly uh, 13 minutes slotted to each time and without wasting much time and to keep session in time i request dr manas ranjan mohanty who will be speaking on seasonal prediction of ic ismr using wrf a dynamical downscaling perspective dr mahanti are you here dr manas ranjan mahanti is not here so can we move on to the next talk Dr. Patnaik, is it okay? Go to the next talk. If he comes, then we will see. Yeah. So, Dr. Ankur Sirvastav is here. Oh, Manas uh, Ranjan Mohan yes. is here. Ankur uh, Sirvastav. Okay. So, I yeah, see Ankur Sirvastav. Yeah. So, morning, Ankur Sirvastav. I request you to uh, deliver your talk on interaction of rivers with the Indian summer monsoon modeling impact on variability and implication for predictability. Thirty yeah. minutes time, and I request Maheshwar Pradhan, who is next, to be ready after this. Yes, Doctor Ankur Sirvastav, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Dimri. I will just share my screen. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. I can see. Great. So, uh, hello everybody. I am Ankur Sirvastav from the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. I will be talking uh, today about the interaction of rivers with the Indian summer monsoon. it's modeling the impact on variability and implications for seasonal predictability uh so uh, it is known from various studies that surface runoff is an important component of the global hydrological cycle 
Our studies have shown that the interaction of rivers with the, with the monsoon system modulates the ENSO monsoon teleconnections, global HSTs and salinity, and is associated with an increased frequency of La Nina events. Further, especially in the Bay of Bengal, uh, which is uh, which is a highly stratified basin, the changes in salinity uh, is linked to the uh, rainfall over the Ganga and Brahmaputra River catchment area, which affects the mixed layer depth and the barrier layer thickness in this uh, in in the Bay of Bengal. Now, studies have also shown that barrier layers of the coast of Kerala caused by the fresh water transport uh, causes SST warming and can cause an early monsoon onset. Uh, we know that Bay of Bengal is convectively active, which that means uh, the, the fresh water, which causes the high stratification, facilitates the genesis of monsoon low pressure systems and affects and hence can affect the convective activity on intra season time scales. Therefore, uh, since rivers are an important component of the monsoon system and they interact with it, it uh, the models should have a realistic representation of rivers. Uh, now, if we if we see the see the climate forecast system version two, which is used for operational forecasts in India, it has a prescribed annual mean climatological runoff into the ocean. Now, prescribing runoff is not a good strategy, especially for coupled models such as the CFS V two. So, we thought of replacing this prescribed annual runoff with a with a interactive runoff. Or, uh, so, basically, how do you do that? How do we represent the horizontal transport of fresh water uh, in our models? Basically, we take a digital elevation map, which is nothing but the topography. Uh, based on this, we delineate, delineate the river basins globally and develop a flow net network based on this DEM uh, and pass the runoff generated by the land surface model through this flow network to get routed stream flow at land ocean boundaries. <coughs> So we basically did two experiments with uh, with our model. First was a control run, which has the prescribed climatological discharge, and the RIV run has a, a routing model coupled to the CFS V2. Uh, this shows the coupling strategy, wherein the RV runoff fluxes from uh, from the land model are passed through the routing model, which gives the early routed runoff at the land ocean boundaries and is passed onto the ocean model at a, on every day. So basically, we did a hind seasonal hind class for 1981 to 2017 with 10 ensemble members using February initial directions. Okay. So, so basically, we wanted to study the uh, the very the uh, three modes of variability, which is at the synoptic time scales, the interseasonal time scales, and the seasonal mean monsoon, which are basically important uh, for the time scales we are interested in. So first, we look at the monsoon low pressure systems, which are which are most important rain bearing systems for the Indian summer monsoon. The upper panel shows the track density of these systems in observations for the control run and the RIV run, and this shows the difference RIV minus detail track density. So we can see that the, the upon the inclusion of a routing model, the track density is higher in the northern Bay of Bengal and the adjoining land areas and the associated. And this is the RIV minus CTL rainfall composite, which shows that the rainfall activity is also significantly higher by up to 1 to 1.5 millimeters per day, which means that they are enhanced due to inclusion of rivers. There is enhanced LPS activity in the model and associated rainfall also. Now, studies have shown that uh, that the peak convective activity in the Bay of Bengal peaks at 28.6 degrees Celsius. Uh, 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 this is the this is the same uh, number of LPS events grouped by the SST uh, values, and we can see in the in the RIV model setup we get the peak peak of convection at 28.6 degrees Celsius in agreement with observations. The bottom panel shows the lifetime of LPS in days, so we can also see that the LPS lifetime has increased uh, in the RIV window. But, so to investigate what causes these changes in the low pressure systems, we did a mixed layer heat budget wherein uh, this plot shows the RIV minus CTL mixed layer temperature tendency. So we can uh, add different lags that is from lag minus five days to lag plus five days. 
So uh, we note that uh, there is significant uh, temperature gradients in the mixed layer heat budget in the mixed layer temperature tendency, which is crucial for LPS simulation and enhances the moisture availability to the system. Then moving on to the interseasonal aspects, we we looked at the monsoon ISO events, which are also important in modulating the rainfall activity during summer monsoon. And for for those ISO events that occur under shallow mixed layer and thick barrier layer conditions, we did a lag composite minus 30 to plus 30 days of the mixed layer depth, barrier layer thickness, SST and rainfall. So we see post lag zero represents the peak of convection. We observe that post the uh, peak convection, the mixed layers are shallower and the barrier layers are thicker in the RIV run, which is the blue curve here. Now, due to this, uh, due to the showing of mixed layers post convection and formation of thicker barrier layers, uh, this causes an intense post convection break. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the ISO amplitude is also higher. So what causes these changes to the to the interseasonal aspect? We did a uh, ISO centered um, composite, um, which uh, we identified the ISO events, and zero basically means the center of the convection, uh, and north of it and to the south of it. This is the specific humidity, the vertical velocity, vorticity, and divergence. So we can see in the, the upper panel is the control run, bottom panel is the RIV run. So we can see. Uh, the, the specific humidity uh, is always higher to the north of the convection center for, the, for every meso event, which is basically responsible for causing the northward propagation of the mesos. And we can see that the, the specific humidity to the north of convection center is higher in the RIV run uh, as compared to the control run. The, the vertical velocity is also higher. Uh, that the associated vorticity to the north of the convection center is higher and there is stronger lower level convergence and upper level divergence. So basically this uh, uh, the, upper, the improved upper ocean variability leads to enhanced air sea interaction in the bay. Uh, the stronger vorticity and specific humidity ahead of the convection center associated with the mesos result, should result in a stronger northward propagating pulse. So we check whether that is true. The, the, we plotted coherent so about 100 coherently propagating meso events. Uh, these are the from observations. This is the control run and the RIV run. So we see uh, the northward propagating pulse is uh, the the convection is stronger for this as compared to control run and much better organized. The SSTs associated with the monsoon active break phases is also better organized as compared to the CTL control run. Then moving on to the to the seasonal aspects, that is the interannual variability. We did a RIV minus CTL difference in the uh, interannual uh, mixed layer heat budget terms. The top panel is the temperature tendency, and the bottom is the surface heat flux forcing. So we see there is significantly greater um, uh, temperature tendency during June, July to June and July months, especially around the discharge locations of Ganga Brahmaputra and Iravani. And uh, it propagates southwards as we move towards Argus, and this is basically caused by the surface heat flux forcing. Uh, the lag correlation between discharge and rainfall shows significantly positive correlations uh, uh, from minus two months to zero months, and are also at lag plus, lead plus one. These lead lag correlations between discharge and rainfall is somewhat stronger in the control run, and uh, is stronger up to plus two months. So this uh, rainfall and discharge coupled feedback cannot be captured by the control run, which is well simulated in the RIV run, though somewhat stronger. Then we basically studied the implications for predictability. We, these are the anomaly correlation coefficients between observations and model. We see uh, this is these are the scales for ISMR. We see significantly higher scales in control run uh, in river run compared to the control run. So just to summarize the mechanism, uh, the fresh water from rivers causes an improved upper ocean stratification, uh, uh, which uh, on the on the LPS front, it causes enhanced gradients in the Bay of Bengal due to the stronger asymmetric heat flux forcings, which causes frequent and longer lived monsoon low pressure systems. Uh, and at the interseasonal time scales, the post convection shoaling of mixed layers and thicker barrier layers form 
which due to the changes in the mixed air heat budget, which causes enhanced air seam fractions restricted to the shallow mixed layer and enhanced specific humidity and vorticity north of the convection center, which causes a stronger mesial associated circulation, which feedbacks to the monsoon low pressure systems and both of these uh, support each other to give a better LPS propagation and better representation of convection and synoptic intra-season timescales and the scale interaction between them cause a better simulation of the season mean modes. Uh, that's thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tekur. Very interesting study linking with river to summer monsoon and like that. Anybody has any question, please, from the room, from the hall? I don't see any raised hands or something like that. If no one has Ankur, I have uh, many queries, though, though understanding for my own self. Yes. Uh, when you are talking, when you are talking of Gangas and Brahmaputra, right? Right. That river is marching to Bay of Bengal. Right. And then you are also taking Irrawaddy. Right? Yes. Yes. And the source of both the rivers are different. Am I right? Yeah. Water True. Source. So are you delineating the water source types, if I understand it that way, to no, the monsoon? No. No, no, we are not delineating the water sources. Basically, the runoff is being generated by the land model. So we basically just delineate the river basin and whatever runoff is generated by the land model in that river basin. Basically, the land model takes care of the sources of uh, runoff and my routing model just routes the runoff which is available from the from that basin. Okay. Yeah, interesting. So my uh, second question, if, if we have a uh, some kind of a isotope process analysis for this type of uh, river water which is discharged in this uh, Bay of Bengal. As right. we see, there are two different. So, dif uh, will there be any kind of a, a differentiation uh, coming into the uh, the oxygen yeah. isotope in this uh, yeah, kind of? Be, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, this is like, this is a very very simplistic model. Basically, we look we are looking at the coarser scale since we are only interested in the seasonal prediction, and we are only interested in whether the annual runoff is being simulated uh, reasonably by our model. Uh, perhaps the isotope analysis, which you might be talking about, requires a much higher resolution uh, uh, analysis, and we need to have traces uh, in the model and a much more complicated routing model, which can uh, account for the river basin scale topography also. Yeah, thank you, Uncle. It's a very interesting and a very new dimension uh, linking to the river. And this, thank you. I congratulate thank you for you, this And now I um, we move on to the next talk by Dr. Maheshwar Pradhan. Improvements yes. in the tropical diurnal cycle by incorporating power flux algorithm in CFP2. Maestro Pardhan, Dr. Pardhan. Yes, sir. Uh, I will just share my uh, presentation. Please go ahead and request to keep it for next 13 minutes, roughly. Yes, sir. I hope uh, I'm audible and uh, my presentation is visible. Yes, you are audible and your uh, slides are seen. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am Maestro Pardhan. I'm doing, uh, I'm working at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune, and simultaneously, I'm doing my PhD from IIT Bombay. And uh, I'll, in next few slides, I'll be presenting how uh, the coupled model simulation can simulate uh, tropical diurnal cycles in a better way and uh, by uh, incorporating the uh, turbulent flux algorithm and diurnal uh, temperature schemes. So I will be focusing on two oh, diurnal temperature variability. So one is called the uh, cool skin temperature, which is basically formed uh, uh, whenever uh, there is a net uh, radiative heat loss uh, uh, from the uh, ocean interface, ocean and atmosphere interface, and that is due to uh, the net radiative loss by long wave sensible heat and latent heat. And at that at that point, the uh, interfacial layer is relatively cooler. Uh, than the uh, uh, bulk uh, ocean temperature, and uh, this is uh, this happens during mostly during uh, night times. And second one is the warm layer uh, temperature, uh, which forms because of the 
net radiative uh, heat gain by the interfacial layer. In this condition, the skin temperature is warmer relative to the bulk ocean temperature and various components that is mainly due to uh, the net radiative uh, balance between short wave and uh, uh, heat losses uh, due to long wave and sensibility and heat, uh, latent heat losses. And both of these uh, diagonal temperature variations are much more sensitive uh, to wind conditions and uh, the cloud or convection, convection uh, condition over uh, the ocean uh, part. So various studies have uh, reported uh, the importance of diagonal SSTs over uh, on the surface as well as subsurface ocean at a longer time scale, such as uh, uh, synoptic to interseasonal time scales, as well as uh, many studies have reported their impact on uh, the atmospheric uh, uh, properties, such as uh, Wellinger et al. 2010 have reported uh, 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 the diagonal convection characteristics is significantly modulated by diagonal SSTs. Uh, then over the ocean, the amplitude of synoptic to interseasonal SST variations are either uh, and can be amplified or can be subdued by process called rectification, which is reported by Mizum et al. 2011, Pian et al. 2021. And the possibility of enhanced equatorial upwelling because of uh, uh, this uh, modulation of equatorial current by diagonal SSTs are also reported by so, some of the sensitive uh, uh, model experiment, experiments carried out by Bernie et al. And uh, the uh, interseasonal to seasonal time scale mixed layer processes are also affected and are reported by Shinoda et al. and uh, others. Uh, at longer time scale, uh, the ENSO related nonlinear teeth like uh, SSD skewness uh, and various ocean atmospheric feedbacks are also altered uh, by these uh, diagonal SSD variations and are reported by my senator. Just to note that uh, an, uh, one Kelvin error in the SSD skin temperature can lead to around 30 watt per meter square net sub, uh, surface heat fluxes, and this can lead to some uh, in uh, what from modeling perspective, it can lead to spurious uh, signals in the uh, coupled models. So next, uh, to incorporate the diagonal uh, variations in uh, our coupled model, so we carried out two sensitivity experiments. One is called control run and another is sensitivity run. In control run, we basically take uh, the default anchor flux scheme. And in sensitivity run, we have implemented the core flux scheme. And the difference of coarse uh, uh, control and sensitivity, sensitivity run basically depicts the uh, difference between NCAR flux scheme and coarse flux scheme and is tabulated here. The basic difference is that coarse flux scheme uh, takes care of the warm light temperature corrections and cool skin temperature corrections. Along with that, the parameterization of uh, stability functions, gustiness, and roughness length also differs in uh, these uh, two algorithms. And we have carried out uh, the high cast for a period of 1981 to 2007, and we are focusing on uh, during the monsoon season, that is JJS. So, to some uh, first to see the uh, implications of implementing diagonal uh, SSTs uh, in the model, uh, we have uh, taken few uh, buoy locations uh, uh, as observation, and we have validated our model results against these buoy locations. And here I have plotted uh, uh, the SSTs in uh, uh, the observation as well as uh, two uh, sensitivity runs, uh, and these are plotted against local solar uh, uh, time. So in observation, which is uh, the in, represented in blue color, uh, the uh, dashed line is uh, the control run, and the dotted line is the sensitivity run. What we can see that uh, uh, in control run, both the maxima, maxima, diagonal maxima, and diagonal minima are shifted uh, as compared to are shifted and delayed in nature as compared to the observation. And but in sensitivity run, that is uh, quietly improved. And this is uh, a location for Bay of Bengal. And uh, here, uh, the both the timings of maxima and minima are quite uh, improved. Similar inferences we can find from uh, locations like uh, this is over, uh, these two locations are over uh, Pacific. And in these two locations also, timings of uh, maxima and minima 
are quite improved in the sensitivity run by implementing diurnal uh, temperature uh, temperature schemes. And another thing uh, you can infer from this plot is that uh, the range, the maxima to uh, minima range in the control run is quite less as compared to the sensitivity run and as uh, also compared to the uh, uh, observations. Thus, to validate the, the diagonal range again, we plotted here uh, like global plot uh, by taking observations and uh, control run. And we define a uh, signal uh, uh, diagonal range DSAT as maximum minus minimum in a 24 hour cycle. And for the period, this is uh, for observation uh, is restricted to that period. That's why we re restricted our models, uh, model results also in this uh, duration. So, what we can see that uh, in the observation, the diagonal range is ranges from 0.4 to 0.7 degrees centigrade over the tropics and uh, northern hemisphere. This is basically the summer hemisphere. In the control run, the uh, diagonal range of SST is quite restricted uh, up to 0 0.2 degrees centigrade, 0.2 or 0.3 degrees centigrade. But uh, by incorporating diagonal uh, temperature schemes, uh, we have seen uh, that the uh, sensitivity run quite uh, uh, well represents the diagonal uh, range of temperature and the enhancement is around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees, 0.4 degrees centigrade and it uh, well represented uh, the diagonal range of SSDs. So to, uh, again, similar to the SSDs, we uh, saw the implications uh, in the subsurface by taking uh, by computing the MLGs from the boy observation as well as uh, from model uh, simulations. And the blue line again shows the, uh, uh, the observation and uh, the, the dashed line shows the control there. Here also you can see that uh, uh, the mid layer variation, that uh, shallowing of uh, mid layer during the uh, late afternoon and uh, 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 the deepening of mid layer in the uh, early night is uh, the difference is used in the observation and the model uh, sensitivity run also uh, the it reproduces the range of MLD quite well. But in uh, uh, control run without uh, without having the diagonal scheme, the range of uh, MLD is uh, uh, quite uh, not significant uh, as compared to the uh, uh, sensitivity run or the observation. Uh, specifically, the nighttime uh, deepening of the MLD is not well reproduced in the control run. So similarly, uh, uh, for uh, de we define diagonal range of MLD as maximum minus minimum uh, um, MLD during the 24 hour cycle because uh, the observations were not uh, available, high frequency observations were not available. We restricted our analysis to uh, model simulations also. And uh, if you can see the difference plot uh, of diagonal ranges, the tropical, whole tropical ocean as an enhancement of diagonal range of uh, MLDs by uh, up to 10 to 15 uh, meters in the tropical uh, oceans. So to link the diagonal SSTs, how they impact the atmospheric conditions, we have taken this plot from Bellinger et al. 2010, where they have reported uh, 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 how the atmosphere behaves with the presence of warm layer, DW element, diagonal warm layer, Strong diagonal in presence of the strong diagonal uh, warm layers and in absence of uh, diagonal warm layers. What they have reported, just to summarize, I am not going going into the details of this plot. What they have suggested that in presence of a strong diagonal uh, warm layers, uh, the wind condition horizontal wind conditions are calm, and there is a reduced downdraft and increased uh, mixed layer height of the atmosphere, and the precipitation is reduced in these conditions. Uh, and this is also accompanied by reduced reduced latency flux or sensibility flux. To uh, carry out the similar analysis uh, in our model simulations, we have also uh, done composite analysis for warm layer events, where warm layer events we defined as where dg1 is greater than uh, one Kelvin temperature. And uh, the left panel shows uh, uh, the horizontal wind speed. Uh, the middle panel is for precipitation and the rightmost panel is for uh, latency fluxes. But we can see that whenever diagonal warming is uh, higher, the control gun simulates uh, higher wind speed 
uh, where it, it, it has to, it is supposed to be uh, calm wind conditions and it is well reproduced in the sensitive season uh, by implementing the diagnosis of uh, and temperature scheme. Similarly, the uh, precipitation uh, is uh, overestimated is a control run uh, over the uh, equatorial belt of uh, Pacific and uh, Bay of Bengal, Eastern Indian Ocean. Uh, but this was not supposed to be there because we, uh, Bellinger et al. suggested that uh, it has to be accompanied to with the reduced rainfall. And similarly, the sensitivity run uh, is, uh, well reproduces uh, these conditions. Also, Bellinger et al. Uh, suggested that uh, uh, the warm layer events has to go, uh, is accompanied by uh, lower uh, uh, latency fluxes, which is not reproduced in the control run, but uh, it is quite improved in the sensitivity runs. So, how the, uh, the uh, diagonal schemes can impact the precipitation uh, events in the diagonal uh, uh, diagonal range is represented here. The first plot is from observation. We can see that the, the diagonal range uh, is uh, quite significant over Bay of Bengal and uh, uh, Eastern Indian landmass, Western Ghats, and Eastern Indian Ocean, and the equatorial belt of uh, 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 Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. So, in if you see the control run, the diagonal range of precipitation is hugely underestimated, and that is significantly improved and quite in agreement uh, with the observation in the sensitivity run. And uh, the uh, mechanisms of how diagonal range, uh, diagonal activities can impact the diagonal precipitation are reported in various studies and are not going into the details. Uh, so, basically, just to summarize, diagonal activities can improve. The diagonal uh, uh, range of precipitation. Further, to see how if the diagonal uh, phase of precipitation can be improved. Uh, yes, sir. Pardon, sorry for interrupting you. Can you wrap it up, please? Yes, yes, last slide only. So, diagonal phase of precipitation. Uh, uh, many studies have reported that uh, there is a uh, uh, well uh, marked signal from uh, Indian landmass to Bay of Bengal. Uh, in the diagonal uh, uh, phase uh, local cycle, and that is well reproduced in both of the uh, model simulation. And we have not uh, uh, changed in any uh, parameterization related to land sea breeze or uh, over land uh, parameterization. Also, we have not changed. That's why we are not ex uh, expecting any huge improvement in the phase propagation of precipitation. Uh, however, the Western Indian landmass uh, have. Uh, there is uh, some improvement uh, of uh, the phase propagation also. So, uh, uh, to see how the diagonal uh, SSH can improve the, uh, can further go into the uh, seasonal and subseasonal scale, uh, uh, I encourage all you to uh, refer to that uh, uh, paper I have shown in the uh, third slide. So, that will be all from my side. Uh, thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, it's not audible, sir. You 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 are muted. This is good effort of uh, tweaking or correcting the cool skin and warm layer temperature. There is a time for one quick question. If somebody has a question to Doctor Pradhan. Yes. Yes. Do you have any question, anybody? Okay, if nobody has, uh, we have quickly moved to next presentation by Dr. Anumeha Dubey. I hope uh, Anumeha is here. Uh, spatial verification of probabilistic rainfall forecast over Indian region. Dr. Anumeha, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sir, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, I can hear you. I can see the slides also. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is the spatial verification of ensemble rainfall forecast over the Indian land region. Um, yeah. uh, so, why do we need to go for uh, the spatial verification? Is that uh, because of uh, the increase in the computational power, we have very high resolution uh, NWT models, but uh, when we try to verify them with the available observations, uh, more often, 
cannot they suffer from a problem of um, double penalty, which is due to the location mismatch between the observed events and the forecast events. And this results in very poor sport if we go in for a grid to grid verification. And uh, therefore, the actual advantages of a high resolution model can never be fully realized uh, with this problem. Um, the advantage of spatial verification is that it does not require a grid to grid matching uh, between the forecast and the observation. Instead, it does uh, a match between a forecast object and an observed object. So, there are many methods that are available for um, the spatial verification. The one that we have uh, applied is the temperatures rainfall area, the CRA method. In this, uh, the, there are objects, uh, both in forecast and observations, which are defined by a particular rainfall threshold. So whatever area is enclosed within a contour of a particular rainfall amount, maybe 10 millimeters, or if you want to go for higher rainfall, maybe like 40 or 80 millimeters for the rainfall. And then we try to compare uh, these two objects and uh, the different uh, components that are uh, described by these objects, like the maxima that is present between these, or the amount of rainfall in terms of the volume, the area, or uh, the rain rate as well. So these can be compared, and uh, this can be used to quantify the biases. Um, also, the total error um, in this case can be defined as a contribution from displacement volume and pattern. Now, there are many uh, studies that are available for the verification of deterministic uh, forecasts, but for ensemble forecasts or probabilistic forecasts, not a lot of work has been done. So, this is our effort in that direction. Uh, we have chosen three monsoon seasons from 2018 to 2020 over Indian region using the model uh, LCMRWF ensemble prediction system, which has a horizontal resolution of 12 kilometers uh, and it's a lag ensemble system with uh, 23. Um, members, one control and 22 perturbed members. So our main aim is to see uh, what is the maximum contribution coming from the it's displacement volume or pattern. And uh, also we usually do a spread scale uh, comparison in order to see if the ensemble system is well formed or a robust ensemble system. And that is what we have tried to see in case of the object parameters like maxima, volume or area. And then we have done a probabilistic verification of these object parameters. So uh, in this case, we have chosen uh, three regions. The big box in the center is the four monsoon region, which gets a lot of rainfall during the monsoon. And then we have the west coast. For this, we have divided into two parts. The northern part of the west coast, which covers the area of Maharashtra and uh, Konkan region. And then we have the uh, second box, which is mostly over Karnataka and Kerala coastal regions. So uh, this is a result um, for a case of 2nd July 2019, where there was a heavy rainfall over uh, Odisha. So the top panel on the left here shows the uh, day one forecast from the deterministic NCMRWF model, NCUMG. And the bottom panel here is from the observation. So if we look at it, we see that uh, the observed pattern is uh, slightly different from what is being forecasted, as well as the location of the maxima is uh, different. So these are the kind of results that we get. Um, first of all, it gives how much is the displacement between the forecast and the observation. So in this particular case, it is two and a half degrees in the eastern side and a quarter degree in the northward direction. Then it also tells about what is the difference between the rain rate in the two um, entities and the maxima rain volume, and what are the contribution uh, uh, coming from uh, to the total mean squared error. So in this case, we see that the volume is pretty well predicted, but the major error is coming from uh, the pattern. Now, this is one case, and if you look, uh, look at the same case for the ensemble prediction system, we see that there are 23 members in the bottom uh, right panel here is the observations. So we see that uh, uh, all the ensemble members are predicting uh, the rainfall, but it is very evident that the maxima here is predicted at very different locations, and all of them have very different uh, structures as well. So this is uh, the uh, 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 the blue patches here are the rainfall exceeding four centimeters per day, and from the observations also we see. So this makes it very clear that all the ensemble members are predicting it at very different locations. Okay. So the first thing that we actually analyzed here is uh, how the members are displaced with respect to the observations. So this is the top two panels are for the west coast, and they uh, were mostly the displacement was seen in the northwest southeast direction, uh, probably because of the orography. 
And uh, the um, uh, displacement in this case is uh, confined to plus minus uh, three degrees in the east west direction. Uh, the last uh, row here is for the core monsoon region, and the displacement is more in the east west direction, and it is also higher than what we see in the west coast region. It is uh, spreading up to plus six degrees on the eastern side. Another interesting thing to be noticed here is that with the increase in the rainfall thresholds, that is for 40 and 80 millimeters, the displacement of the members is actually lower uh, or the systems are more organized in that case. If we look at uh, the uh, total mean squared error, then as expected, uh, the error is uh, increasing with the lead time and also it is higher for uh, higher thresholds, but the least error is seen in the core monsoon region. Uh, if we uh, look at the uh, individual contribution from the different um, components, displacement, volume, and pattern, we can see that pattern contributes the maximum. Uh, so the pattern error, uh, this is usually true for uh, almost all the cases where pattern contributes the maximum, and usually the volume of uh, rainfall is quite well predicted in um, all the cases. And uh, it, uh, once again, in the core monsoon region, the contribution from displacement and volume is low, but for the pattern, it is at the highest. So looking at the RMC versus uh, the spread, uh, the uh, for uh, we have chosen three parameters here, that is maximum, volume, and area. We see uh, with the increase in the rainfall threshold, which is if you move column wise, there is a lot of difference between the RMC and the spread. For a good system, they should um, actually be aligned very close to each other. So it increases, that means the uh, skill of the forecast is decreasing. Uh, but in case of rainfall volume and area, we see with the increasing threshold, uh, the model is able to perform better or there is more uh, skill in the model. We look at the probabilistic um, attributes. We see that once again, the volume and area are performing much better uh, because they have a lower Briar score, uh, which is a difference between the probability and the observations, uh, forecast probability and the observations. So it should be as close to zero as possible. So for both volume and area, it is much lower. The Briar scale score should be higher. It should be closer to one. And it's not close to one, but still for volume and area, it is higher. Whereas for a uh, maxima of rainfall, it is becoming negative also. Then uh, if we look at the rock curve, we see that uh, the volume is actually doing a better job because this curve should be aligned along the top left diagonal for it to be a good uh, skillful uh, forecasting system and which is followed by area and finally maxima is a lot very close to the diagonal line. Um, then uh, we have the reliability curve here, uh, which also shows that for rainfall maxima, it did, for a good system, it should be aligned along the diagonal. Row. So the forecast um, the probability should be similar, so it should be the same as the observed frequency. And in this, the reliability curve for the maxima is further away from the diagonal line as compared to the volume as well as the area. And finally, we have the area under the ROC curve, which is just the area under this curve, and this should be one ideally for a good uh, system. So we see that um, for volume and area, this is higher, whereas for the rainfall maxima, this is much lower. So um, in conclusion, what I wanted to say to this is that the intensity of rainfall is a challenging attribute to predict, whereas volume and area are uh, better predicted uh, by our uh, ensemble prediction system. And therefore, uh, we uh, are trying to develop more and more products which make use of these skillful attributes. And uh, the intensity of rainfall is um, uh, requires some kind of post processing or bias prediction methods for it to be more of a, uh, to be, for it to be more accurate. Uh, that's it for my time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dubey, for keeping in much time. There are time for questions. Uh, is there any question for the talk on the talk, please? Anumaya, I just want to know yes. two things in this yes, continuous sir. rainfall area. It's a basically statistically driven uh, techniques, right? Uh, sir, it's not statistically driven. What we do is we take the two objects that are formed, uh, I mean, within the forecast and the observations. Then the forecast is moved uh, and shifted over the observations and then it is rotated. So a best fit is uh, obtained between the forecast and the ob observed yeah. object. And based on that, then we calculate how much was it shifted, uh, how many points within the forecast are excluded when it is matched with the observations. 
So all of that gives you the error. Yeah. So that's why my query was in in fact when you are talking of rainfall volume. Yes, sir. How you are uh, looking for rainfall volume in uh, this switch from one point to another point? So, no, sir, uh, when we translate the forecast over the observation, some points from the op uh, forecast can uh, actually be removed. So, there is a criteria that not more than 25% of the points from within the forecast objects can be uh, excluded while the match is conducted. And then there are a number of grid points that are present within that forecast objects. And there is a rainfall forecast available on each of those grid points, and that is used uh, along and the area obviously we know because of the object, and so that is used to calculate the volume. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I congratulate for employing new technique, new methods. Uh, thank you, Anumeha. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So we will move on to next talk uh, by Dr. Asish Kumar Mitra. Mitra, sir. Are you here? Uh, good morning, I'm here. Yeah, good morning, Professor Dr. Mitra. Uh, the talk is on implementation of a seamless modeling system at NCMRWF Ensemble Monsoon Prediction from Hours to Season. Dr. Mitra? Yeah, uh, I've said it. So, uh, is it visible uh, in full screen? Yeah, I can see. Not full screen. Maybe you have to do full screen. I can yeah, see. Thank you. Yeah, now I've done it uh, full screen. So, I will be briefly presenting uh, the seamless modeling system at NCMRWF. So, it's one of the unique uh, modeling system in the world. So, uh, why... Uh, one minute, the slides are not moving. Yeah, so this center is under the Ministry of Arts Science and uh, our main uh, mandate is to underpin the forecasting capability of uh, the National Weather Service. And we are also responsible for the data assimilation system, and we are also uh, mandated to develop the, and implement the seamless modeling system and develop applications. So as we know, uh, from various uh, scale, there are applications of these weather and climate models. And uh, the seamless modeling system, so it's a unique thing which caters from smaller scale to even climate change scale. So that's the beauty of this uh, seamless modeling system. There are many advantages of the seamless modeling system. So I will go to the uh, last but one point uh, that it uh, makes the synergy between short scale and climate scale. So if you see, uh, many centers are still developing the seamless modeling system, but we have implemented it uh, in collaboration with our partners. And uh, uh, because of the continuous uh, increase in HPC and model resolution and data assimilation, the scale of the model is continuously improving. You can see how the RMS is decreasing over the years. And if we compare with other uh, lead center, uh, we are also very close to them. And uh, that's mainly because, as I said, due to the data input. So huge amount of satellite data is being uh, put into the model. And we also compare with ECMWF always this uh, data. And uh, this HPC, continuously we are improving our HPC. Now we have 2.8 petaflop of HPC and we are targeting another uh, 15 to 20 petaflop uh, by this year. And we have many users, but our main user is IMD. And uh, one example, there are customized forecasts also we give when uh, agencies approach us. So you might have heard about the uh, Indian Navy's Tharini team, all women team, which uh, circumnavigated the globe. So the weather and ocean forecast we are supplying from this center. And apart from that, we have many other users, uh, government, and uh, interestingly, many private companies, uh, energy, wind energy, and solar energy companies, they are coming forward. And this center also caters to the BIMSTEC uh, association. So the BIMSTEC country also closely work with us. We train and share our products. And all this is possible because of the uh, MOES uh, collaboration with the EOM, EOM consortium. So we have core partners like uh, Bureau of Metrology, uh, New Zealand Met Department, South Africa, US Air Force, Met Office. So this is all uh, the development of the model and data assimilation system is possible because of this government to government collaboration under the UM consortium. So we have uh, under the seamless modeling system, 
global and regional data assimilation, land surface data assimilation, and ocean data assimilation system. And these are the uh, data, satellite and in-situ observations, which are used in the assimilation system. And we have another very interesting system developed here called the FSOI. So it shows the impact of observation. This is very useful when we work with ISRO and other agencies that what exactly is the impact of a particular observing system in the uh, forecast. So we can optimize the use of observation and a lot of resources can be optimized by this way. And recently we have implemented uh, something called Elus Wind and it has a very good positive impact in the model. And uh, the IMD is radar. So our main priority is now to assimilate all the radar into the seamless modeling system for severe weather in shorter time scale. We are also developing something called HRR system. So that means every one hour you assimilate and forecast for next nine to 10 hours. So this is also a priority and the land surface assimilation we are already doing, but this is also a priority. Uh, currently we are assimilating only satellite soil moisture, but we plan to incorporate other observations into this. And another important thing, there are separate talks uh, that under the regional data assimilation, we have produced a very good data reanalysis 12 kilometers. So there are separate talk on this. So until now, what I saw 18,000 users are registered for this product. So coming back to the seamless uh, modeling system, so you can see very fine scale 330 meter Delhi model to coupled global model for extended and seasonal prediction we have configured at various scales. So the same dynamical core is used across scale. So it's very beneficial. So these are the different models we have uh, from part of the seamless modeling system and the ensemble prediction system also is there. So as I said earlier, it caters from very small scale, Delhi fog model to extended and seasonal prediction. The single dynamical core uh, does this job. So these are some of the uh, recent results like the Kerala rain and we saw the regional model is doing much better and the Uttarakhand rain also signal was good, but the regional model captured it much better. Uh, and these are some of the scores for 2021 monsoon. We do it for uh, each monsoon to improve the model. So there are biases in the model, but when we compare uh, uh, up to five days forecast and compare with other centers, as I showed, so they are uh, at par with uh, other centers. And this is another thing which you can see in the internet coordinated by ECMWF that where our model stands compared to other models. So the website I have seen here, uh, we do it very regularly. And another application uh, that uh, for the basin scale, for hydrological application, how good is this forecast? So we saw the regional model is much better compared to the global model because of the resolution. And this is the Delhi fog model. So we have compared with observation at uh, Delhi airport. So the temperature, moisture, visibility uh, agrees well. So this is, is used by IMD for winter fog prediction. And we are trying to improve this by improving chemistry and more urban uh, morphology into putting into this. So this model will be replicated to other cities as an urban model. Uh, coming to the ensemble prediction system, we have two ensemble prediction systems, regional and global. So this is one of the highest resolution model in the world. And this is shared with uh, ECMWF. So all the data uh, people interested can download from uh, ECMWF. And it's very useful for defining the probability strike rate for the tropical cyclone. Similar thing for the rainfall also, we give probability of heavy rain, etc. So these are two examples of 2021 cyclones. So very good ensemble mean products, uh, 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 prediction was there. And you can see the uncertainty from the ensemble prediction system, which is very useful for administrators. Similarly, for heavy rain also, this is the Kerala rain. It was showing that probability more than 11 centimeter. What is the probability? It was 75% probability what it was showing. Similarly, for the Uttarakhand rain, it was showing the probability that there is a high probability between 50, uh, more than 75%. So these uh, ensemble prediction systems are very useful. And recently we have developed this uh, uh, lightning forecast in terms of probability. This is a new product. You can see it in our website. Now coming to the coupled model part of the seamless prediction system, we do extended range prediction, which is very useful for predicting the dry wet spell. So how nicely three to four weeks in advance, the weekend dry spells are uh, captured. You can see here as a sample from 2021 monsoon. And the onset of monsoon also we predicted four weeks in advance. There was a delayed monsoon in 2019. 
and uh, seasonal prediction also has very good skill compared to any other model so 2021 it was showing uh, average to above average rainfall which came out to be true and we have compared with ecmw forecast and compares very well with ecmw forecast and uh, so for this initializing the couple model we have ocean data assimilation system it's one of the best ocean data assimilation system almost same as what ecmwf uses and we have compared with our rama buoy they perform very well and the tropical cyclone heat potential which we share with imd is very very useful in cyclone uh, monitoring very recently we have developed a nine kilometer global model so we are upgrading our couple model and we have tested the uh, very high resolution ad resolving ocean model which is a uh, nine kilometer so it will be implemented with the new hpc and uh, uh, very recently we are developing a regional couple model also so we have seen when you include the wave uh, fully coupled atmosphere, ocean, wave, and land surface with hydrology. The best prediction comes. It's a case study of cyclone. And uh, so this will be in place where, as soon as the new HVC comes for severe weather and cyclone. And we also have the capability to predict for the polar region. So this is used by NCPOR whenever there is a requirement. So we have the capability to uh, simulate the polar sea ice as part of this coupled model. Uh, very useful for our uh, MOES uh, operations there. Uh, with that, I'll finish. So uh, mainly we'll be working in future with the new uh, enhanced HBC. We want to mainly go to the coupled NWP. So ECMWF is the only center which has gone to the coupled NWP. So we are working, we have already tested it. It's in place, but HPC is the bottleneck. So when we get the new HPC, we'll do medium range coupled NWP and uh, ensemble members will increase. And the last item is to enhance the users, how to use this ensemble prediction system for all applications. So thank you with that, I will finish. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Mitra. There are a lot of advancement you have introduced in the present forum and it's very appreciable that the various uh, climate phenomena as well as the modeling strategy the center is advancing with time again and again uh, any question uh, probably for an overview soon by dr mitra about ncmrw okay i uh, out of a uh, very different uh, context uh, dr mitra i just want to know why uh, these kind of uh, things can uh, surely will be interacting with academic students, I believe, who do not have the HPCs to simulate like JNU, like any other universities, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll be very happy to collaborate with academic institutes. We are having selected, but uh, yeah, one of the recommendation is to work closely with academic institute. Yeah, we'll be happy uh, provided the proposal uh, lies with the mandate of the center so we'll be very happy to work on that yeah. particularly developing application yeah yeah thank you uh, dr mitra it's a very impressive introductory overview of the ncmr wf in various dimensions thank you thank so you we move to the next uh, dr sri kala pp is uh, dr sri kala pp is here yes sir i'm here yeah yeah please so we are having the next talk on the simulation of northeast monsoon rainfall over southern peninsular India in CMA5 model. Dr. Srikala Pipi, please go ahead. Can you go ahead, please? Uh, uh, just one minute. Uh... Is this visible? Yeah, it's uh, visible, but it's uh, need to be done 90 degree east rotation, orientation. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you rotate it?
or maybe I request organizers if they can pop her slides. Is there somebody from organizer team? I, I don't know. Yes, uh, yeah, we will share and we will control. You can move. Yeah, yes. please. I, I, I'll request. I'm sorry. I'll request the administra administration. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, just one minute. I'm sure. Yeah, it's better now. Uh, my uh, topic is. Can you be louder? Can you be louder, Dr. Srikala? You speak louder. Okay, sir. Uh, am I audible? Better. Yes, it's better now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay, my topic is on the simulation of Northeast monsoon rainfall over Southern Peninsula India in semi five models. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, coming to the introduction, as we know, it uh, it is uh, the rainfall is uh, more over the uh, southern peninsula of India, especially over Tamil Nadu region, where we don't get enough rainfall uh, during southwest monsoon season. So it is important to study uh, the variability of northeast monsoon rainfall over Tamil Nadu. Next. Okay, this is the seasonal uh, rainfall. Uh, uh, as you can see, the rainfall is more over the uh, maritime continent and on an average uh, 334 millimeter rainfall we are receiving over the southern peninsula of India and its uh, CV coefficient of variation is very high 25. It makes the uh, prediction uh, uh, of the rainfall uh, difficult. Next. So uh, the motivation of my study is uh, based on I have done some uh, trend analysis for Northeast monsoon rainfall from 1979 to 2012. We found that there is an increasing trend in uh, Northeast rainfall, uh, Northeast monsoon rainfall over uh, ocean as well as over the land. So we, want, we would like to check the, what will be the future. So we wanted to uh, first we wanted to check the skill of the simify models. So uh, I did the analysis of 35 models, how, how uh, well uh, the uh, models are simulating the Northeast Coast rainfall. Uh, next one. Yeah, I just already uh, discussed. Uh, so we know the uh, the interangle variability of Northeast Coast rainfall is positively correlated with the NSO and IOD. It is uh, opposite to the uh, southwest monsoon rainfall, but uh, we have seen a poor skill is uh, 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 in simulating the mean state and interannual variability of northeast monsoon rainfall. Actually, in the models, we have seen uh, the uh, uh, the relationship between the northeast monsoon rainfall and El Nino is opposite to the observation. Next one. So uh, here I, I, I'm showing the data set I used. There are uh, 34 models and other uh, uh, observed data set is from hard ISST and uh, era five uh, wind data set and the GPCB rainfall. Uh, next one. Okay, uh, coming to the uh, results, uh, as you can uh, see, the, there is a, a multimodal ensemble and uh, observation. There's a, is, uh, positive uh, uh, rainfall anomaly over the uh, southeast uh, uh, in the ocean, southwest indian ocean region and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, taylor diagram we can see uh, many models are uh, uh, predicting uh, the correlation is between 0 0.6 to 0 0.9 and uh, i have selected uh, five uh, low skill models and five uh, high skill models and i did a comparative study next one so this is the uh, uh, bias in uh, multimodal ensemble and high skill model and uh, low skill model. Uh, this is for uh, first one is for rainfall and uh, the next is for uh, wind. Uh, what we have seen is in uh, uh, LSM that is in low, low skill model, the uh, observed equatorial westerlies uh, during this season is not uh, simulated well, and there is a convergence of the uh, southwest. Uh, in the ocean region, and we can see a, 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 post, a, a positive bias in the rainfall over that region. So, uh, since the model is not able to simulate the equatorial westerlies, uh, I, I think this uh, uh, this uh, negative uh, bias over uh, peninsular India and positive bias over uh, southwest Indian Ocean is uh, observed in low skill models, but it is better in the uh, high skill models. So, 
So uh, did the uh, bi uh, bias in SST and uh, uh, wind. Uh, here also uh, we can see uh, in HSM uh, model, uh, sorry, in LSM model, uh, we could see uh, a, a positive SST bias over the Southwest uh, uh, Indian Ocean region and uh, negative SST bias over the uh, Southeast Indian Ocean region. And it, it can be, uh, uh, it is manifested in the uh, Walker cell circulation as well. Uh, we could uh, see a uh, ascending motion over the, uh, uh, this 40 to 60 East uh, region, which is responsible for the uh, positive bias in rainfall uh, over uh, Southwest Indian Ocean region. Next is so I did analysis on intraannual variability. Uh, next, so from the observation we have seen uh, during El Nino, uh, uh, we could observe a uh, positive rainfall anomaly over uh, Western Indian Ocean as well as the uh, Peninsular Indian uh, region and negative rainfall anomaly uh, or the Eastern Indian Ocean. And they just opposite uh, kind of uh, anomalies of certain Lanina composite. And IOD and Elino composite of uh, rainfall is similar. And while uh, Lanina and negative IOD composite uh, is uh, similar with uh, negative rainfall anomaly over peninsular Indian region during Lanina and then negative IOD. So we wanted to check whether the models are able to uh, get this uh, signal. Okay. Next. So this is the uh, observation, uh, probability of uh, excess during El Nino is 0.27. And for an ENSO IOD year, it is around 0.63. Uh, and probability of normal and excess is 0.88 for an ENSO IOD year and 0.75 for uh, uh, Lanino year while 0.82 is for El Nino year. So uh, uh, this is the uh, SST composite of flood. And uh, we have seen uh, the correlation of uh, Southern Peninsular Indian rainfall with uh, Nino 3.4 SST and also with uh, DMI. DMI is uh, this uh, orange color and uh, Nino 3.4 SST is blue color. So here, as we can see, most of the models, uh, around 70% of the models uh, were not, uh, not able to get the observed positive uh, correlation uh, between the El Nino and uh, Northeast Monsoon rainfall or Southern Peninsular India. Uh, so, 70% uh, of models were not able to uh, get this relationship. So, again, we have selected some low scale and high scale models uh, on the basis of this uh, correlation. Next. So, this is the uh, result. Uh, uh, this is the regression map of Nino 3.4 SST onto the North Eastman's rainfall and uh, uh, SST and wind. Here, SST is the shaded portion and uh, rainfall is the contour lines. So, uh, in the low scale models, we couldn't uh, uh, we couldn't uh, observe the uh, positive rainfall anomaly over southern peninsular India. In the low scale model, we have also seen a extender uh, uh, called tank uh, 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 SST. Uh, this uh, warm SST over this uh, called tank is extended uh, more uh, uh, westward. Uh, but in a high scale model, even though there are uh, uh, many uh, error we could see, but uh, the rainfall over southern peninsula India is better simulated in the high scale model, and uh, 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 SST over the uh, 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 Western Pacific is uh, mostly uh, similar to the observation. This is the observation. Uh, next one. A similar kind of uh, analysis is done for the uh, uh, type one model index. We could uh, see a similar kind of result in this one also. Next one. So I did an analysis uh, uh, for the uh, uh, Harley and Rocker circulation. So uh, uh, we can see a, uh, from the observation, we could see a, a ascending uh, uh, anomaly over uh, 5 to 10 degree uh, north uh, region. This is uh, actually uh, related with the uh, rainfall of this region. And this could uh, find in a high skill model, but there are uh, a serious error uh, in the uh, uh, 10 south to equatorial uh, region. Uh, this uh, descending motion is uh, not observed in the uh, observation, but still uh, high skill uh, models are ba based on the southern peninsular Indian rainfall. So this ascending anomaly is observed in high skill model, but uh, not in the uh, uh, low skill model where we could find uh, descending uh, anomalies over this uh, region. 
uh, next one. Okay, the, this is a similar uh, analysis for the uh, uh, IOD. Uh, here also we could, uh, even though there are erroneous uh, uh, simulation for this descending anomaly, but we could see a ascending anomaly over the 5 to 10 degree north uh, region. Next one. This is for the uh, walker circulation. Uh, here also uh, uh, we could uh, uh, find uh, in uh, 60 to 80 degree, that is our region, we could find a uh, ascending anomaly in the HSM as well as in the observation, but uh, that is not observed in the LSM. Uh, and uh, also this uh, uh, descending anomalies are uh, more uh, uh, is extended uh, more towards uh, uh, western region in the LSM model. That could be a, a reason uh, for the uh, uh, negative rainfall anomaly over the southern peninsular India uh, in the LSM models. Okay. Next one. Next. So coming to the uh, conclusion, uh, CIMIC-5 models capture the mean uh, northeast monsoon rainfall over uh, Indian Ocean and southern peninsular India reasonably well uh, with a pattern correlation ranging from 0 0.6 to 0 0.93 uh, and RMSC between 1.73 to 3.83. So positive IOD like mean SST bias in Indian Ocean and weak Lanina like uh, mean SST bias in positive question is observed in the low scale models. And low scale models could not simulate the observed equatorial uh, Indian Ocean westerlies, which leads to the abnormal ascending motion and unrealistic wet bias over the western Indian Ocean and dry, dry bias over the southern peninsular India, Southeast Asia and Southeast Indian Ocean. So around 70 percentage of CMIP-5 models were not able to capture the observed positive correlation that exists between the southern peninsular Indian rainfall and the North Ripon for SST as well as uh, SPR of uh, DMI. And El Nino and PAOD related warm SST anomaly over the equatorial Pacific Waltang is found to be extended more westward in the lost models. And along with the westward extension of the Waltang, the observed El Nino and PAOD related anticyclonic circulation over the South, South China Sea and Bay of Bengal is found to be shifted more westward. This is manifested by the unrealistic westward shifting of descending anomalies up to 70 degree east in the walker cell circulation. And this descending anomalies over the northwestern Indian Ocean and southern peninsular India causes erroneous dry anomalies over the southern peninsular India and negative uh, correlation coefficient between southern peninsular Indian rainfall and in of 3.4 SST as well as southern peninsular Indian rainfall and uh, type 1 model let's say a loss. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srikala PP. Is there any question uh, for the talk on uh, Northeast Monsoon? If not, thank you, Dr. Srikala. Right? Thank you thank for you. interesting talk. And um, if uh, we have few minutes, if anybody has any comments, question, queries for a general house, I invite. If not that, I thank you all the speakers for their excellent presentation and advancement in the process of the monsoon modeling, monsoon at different different scale and their themes leading to the better prediction in the future modeling strategies, statistical strategies for a better prediction for extreme weathers. They are very important nowadays. Various techniques improvements are there, methods are improving, data is in, observations are improving. So I'm very happy to be part of that. And I specifically thank the co organizer of International Workshop on Monsoon for giving me this opportunity to coordinate. With these words, I thank you all. And I hand over this to the administration. And thank you, administration, to handling this session well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patnak as well. Over thank to you, Dr. Yeah, Professor Dimit, thank you very much. Actually, yes, very interesting talks were there. Yes, uh, but starting from modeling aspect and Sijana Purka, then last talk uh, from Kochi University. So variety of talks were there. I think it is very good. We actually, we, we missed one talk in the initial thing. I think we could not get proper communication. Otherwise, uh, we could have arranged it. But uh, anyway, so it is very good session. And thank you, I think, all the speakers and chair for the very wonderful session. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, with the hall B, it is going on 11.30, it will be over. And so we will be going for next uh, session, that is the short oral.
session that will start at 11:45 local that is 11:45 local time in hall a that is about 6 6:15 utc yeah 6 utc 11:30 yeah so 6:15 so we'll come back at after about uh, 25 minutes from now thank you very much sir
डॉक्टर बुशेर to kindly coordinate this session so since uh, we have 1 hour 45 minutes for the entire 18 talks and uh, we can have slight flexibility earlier we were thinking it is 2 and 1/2 minutes it can be slightly uh, higher and if the person finish in time you can allow a one question specifically if there will be okay over to you laskar okay so good morning good afternoon and good evening to all of you and welcome to the 7th wmo international workshop on monsoon iwm7 and session 24 sp so our presenters may i welcome our first presenter dr sapna sasane so already patnaik sir has inform that about timing and other thing we will we can entertain at least one questions for each presentation if there is any question so let us start with our presenter first presenter dr sapna sasane dr sapna are you there so can you dr busher can you go to next if yes sir we are moving okay so sanjukta rani padi good morning sir good morning so can i start yeah please good morning everyone my name is sanjukta rani padi senior research fellow in department of marine science barampur university odisha my topic is active break cycle of indian summer monsoon and their variability during cold and warm phase and objective of the paper uh, there are five objective identify the active break cycle uh, using the imd daily graded rainfall data for july and uh, august for the core monsoon zone 18 north to 28 north and 65 east to 88 degrees uh, east to examine the variability in active break for the every 10 days period and every decade during the uh, study period that is 191 to 2020 and examine various statistical features of active uh, and break spells during the cold phase that is first 60 year 191 to 1960 and the second phase that is warm phase 1961 to 2020 to understand and second next objective is to understand the evolution of active and break spell from the lag 0 minus 5 minus 10 minus 15 and minus 20 days uh, we take here for the composite of rainfall sst olr 10 meter wind latent uh, heat flux and sensible heat flux we take here the zero days that is the starting of the spell starting days the of the spell and the next objective is uh, examine the composite anomaly pattern of rainfall olr sst and surface pressure wind 10 meter wind during the active and break spell next slide next slide okay uh, data and methodology as i told with her uh, before that uh, i take the i daily graded imd rainfall data for the whole period that is 191 to 2020 and noa daily average oist and olr for the period 1982 to 2020 as before 1982 the daily data are unavailable so i we take the sst olr uh, for 80 1982 to 2020 and daily mean latent heat flux sensible heat flux 10 meter wind from ncep anchor uh, for the same period before that is 1982 to 2020 and we divide the whole period 191 to 2020 into two part that is cold phase and the warm phase uh, as shown in figure 3 the sst train uh, for the 191 to 1960 in the left panel and the right panel is 1961 to 
and the active brick spell has been identified uh, followed the paper rajivan et al 2010 the period the period during who is the standardized rainfall anomaly is more or less plus 1 or minus 1 uh, consecutively for 3 days we take that is it's active and dead days uh, we take the uh, core monsoon zone rainfall is indian summer monsoon rainfall is highly correlate with monsoon rainfall of the core monsoon zone that is uh, correlation is 0.8 uh, so we take the core monsoon zone rainfall for this study uh, and the my next figure uh, is shows the 10 days period uh, of the active break uh, cycle and the second figure is the uh, right panel uh, figure two right panel shows the decade wise figure in uh, first figure we can see that active uh, days are first uh, increasing blue color active days are first uh, increasing in july and then decreasing in august which is opposite of uh, to the break days that is uh, 317 uh, are more in 21st to 31st can, july can you, and break can days to, can you go to say your summary please sorry time is over Time okay. will work. You can okay. go to okay. yourself. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, in the whole period, we get that the, we find nine hundred ninety-three active spells from who is hundred six are in cold phase and eighty-seven in warm phase and hundred forty-two in break uh, break spell uh, from where we get sixty-six in cold phase and seventy-six in uh, warm phase. Active day spells uh, three to four days are followed by five to six days are more as compared to longer days. however the longer days greater than 11 uh, days are uh, uh, days break spells are more than active spells during cold phase and warm phase the increasing trend found in active days while break days shows a decreasing and trend in cold phase and increasing trend in warm phase uh, comparison to uh, considering the decadal variability active days are more during 1941 to 50 and break days are more in 1991 to 2000 During August, number of active days are maximum during 21st to 31st July, and break days are more in 21st to 31st August. After 31st uh, July, decreasing uh, trend observed in active days and increasing uh, order uh, trend are in uh, break days. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any quick question? Only one question we can entertain. no if so if there is no any question so we can go to our next speaker dr sudip kumar bl dr sudip kumar acha laska can you read the name and find out how many are available okay then dr sudip kumar are you available miss ankita dr joni uh, good afternoon sir okay okay so you I'm are ankita. okay so dr joni yes sir i am available dr ramratan yes sir i am available dr busher is available Vikram Raj, Mr. Vikram Raj. Mr. Vikram Raj, you are there. Mr. Ashutosh, Miss Nandini. Yes, sir, I am here. Mr. Anandu Raj, Rajiv. Yes, sir. Miss Manali. Miss Minu, R Naya, R Naya. Yes, sir, I'm there. Miss Basundara, Basundara. Mr. Shubhroto Haldar. Yes, sir. Miss Priyanka Singh. Yes, sir. Mr. Benu Gopal. This is no new program. 
सुदीप कुमार देने चार्ट में से सुदीप कुमार बाल ही जाएंगे लेबुल ये सर 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 ये स
the uh, atmospheric boundary layer is condition conditionally unstable in both active and weak phases. And if you see the uh, vertical profile in Mumbai, it is uh, almost neutral or means uh, slightly uh, uniform due to the well convective mixing in Mumbai. It is uh, we can see that almost uh, uh, uniform up to a, uh, around uh, 1000 or in the uh, low up boundary layer, it is almost neutral. So that indicates high convective mixing in the Mumbai. So uh, the summary uh, is that uh, due to this uh, vertical profile variation in the vertical profile of wind, so that uh, mainly influences the thermodynamic structure and uh, we can see uh, uh, so that indicates or uh, favorable for the uh, stratiform kind of uh, uh, clouds in the southern parts and uh, vertically developed clouds over the uh, Mumbai study we could uh, identify the, the different thermodynamic structure of this south uh, uh, central and parts of the west coast so that's all thank you okay thank you any question No. So thank you very much, Dr. Sudip. Thank you. Sir. So next presenter will be Miss Ankita. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, please. So may I start? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm Ankita Katoch. I'm from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And today my topic is wet scavenging of heavy metals during monsoon in Delhi. So the objectives of this study are to assess the heavy metal concentrations in rainfall in Delhi during monsoon months of July and August in 2021 and to determine the relative abundance and interactions of heavy metals which are toxic to human health and are contributed by anthropogenic sources. Next slide, please. So for methodology, the heavy metals are scavenged during rainfall and therefore the atmospheric deposition of heavy metals is an important marker of precipitation chemistry. Uh, in this study, the rainfall samples were collected at JNU itself. Uh, um, the coordinates of this uh, site are 28 degree north and 77 degree east. Uh, JNU has a very high green cover and it has a total campus area of 4.12 kilometers square. So the samples were collected using sampling assembly of bottle and funnel of diameter 20 centimeter as shown in the figure. Samples were digested after collection using 1, one milliliter of 5% nitric acid and were preserved for at 4 degrees Celsius for analysis. The prepared samples along with the blanks were analyzed using ICP OES and the samples were analyzed quantitatively using multi-element standard. Next slide please. Uh, so, for the results and summary, uh, the figure 3 shows the relative abundance of heavy metals during rainfall events, whereas the figure 4 shows a matrix showing the interactions between heavy metals and uh, rainfall depth. Next slide, please. Uh, the important results were that it was observed that among all the estimated metals, aluminium showed the highest mean concentrations uh, of about 1059.2 microgram per liters. The concentrations of this lithogenic metal ranged from 0 to 5180 5, microgram per liter during the months of July and August. Uh, but uh, this metal is of uh, crustal origin. Uh, it can also be anthropogenic, but as well as crustal. Among the heavy metals, which are uh, primarily contributed by anthropogenic sources, lead, nickel, and chromium were the most abundant, uh, abundant metals at the selected site. Uh, the Pearson's correlation uh, coefficient in the previous figure showed good association between nickel and chromium, which indicated common sources such as fuel combustion. As for the crustal elements, uh, good correlations were observed for aluminium and iron, uh, aluminium and barium, barium and uh, uh, iron, which showed their origin from mineral ores in the dust. Negative association between rainfall depth and heavy metals uh, indicated the scavenging effect of rainfall on heavy metals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any question? I just have one question. Yeah, please. I just want to know, like, how many samples were collected and what was the duration? Uh, sir, the samples were collected uh, during July and August, and the number of uh, rain events that we could collect were about 15. 
It's just one season or it's spread uh, across yeah. different seasons? Uh, no, sir. It was only for 2021. So only 15 okay. samples. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other question from anyone? No. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ankita. Thank you, sir. Next presenter is Dr. Joni. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Please start. In this work, I am uh, analyzing the uh, performance of the GFS and GFS model, which is uh, operationally running at IMD. So IMD is uh, routinely providing the forecast in the medium range scale using the global forecast system and the 21 uh, determining system and the 21 member global ensemble forecast system. Both the models are running at a T 1534 resolution. So here we evaluated the uh, rainfall forecast of the GFS and GFS model during the southwest monsoon period from June to September, and uh, it is over the over the Indian region. And we have studied it is over the different spatial domains, different homogeneous regions of the IMD. And uh, we have studied also model forecast in the prediction of the extreme rainfall event. So this uh, rainfall is verified. Uh, model forecasts are verified against the IMD uh, related rainfall data which is combining the rain gauge observation and uh, satellite drained the report and uh, extreme rainfall events uh, for studying the extreme rainfall event we used a uh, you know our imd synoptic station uh, rainfall observation and uh, here we this is a mean error in the gfs and gfs model for the june july august uh, jjs period so it is observed that uh, um, you know, individually, if you are looking for the June, July, August, September month separately also, over the land region of the west coast, there is a underestimation of the rainfall and northeast region, there is a overestimation of the rainfall. And uh, the land uh, sea region of the west coast also, there is an over, overestimation of the rainfall. And for comparing the uh, rain, extreme rainfall even, since uh, we, we are comparing the model rainfall with the uh, station observation we considered the, uh, the maximum rainfall occ occurring in the 0.5 degree around the uh, model uh, station location in the model forecast we considered for the uh, comparing with the synoptic observation synop uh, synop uh, synop session observation so he here we are saying the uh, what what percentage of the uh, observed rainfall model was able to predict in different rainfall category so extreme we here we selected only the extreme rainfall observation that is uh, above 20 centimeter and we found uh, that uh, at what percentage of this rainfall is predicted by the model in uh, different categories so uh, the first uh, top panel is the gfs model and uh, uh, bottom panel is the gfs ensemble mean so we found that uh, only 10 percentage of the heavy rainfall events only extreme rainfall event only model was able to predict in the extreme rainfall category and 25 percentage it is able to predict in the very heavy rainfall category and almost 85 percentage of the model was able to predict in the heavy rainfall or above category that is six centimeter and above rainfall category so this is this picture is for south peninsula and we have uh, done it for the uh, northwest india central india and the eastern uh, northeast india so we have almost 85 percentage of the this extreme rainfall event model was able to predict in heavy rainfall or above category on the south peninsula uh, north uh, northeast eastern northeast india and central india and uh, central uh, northwest india that uh, it, it was around 60 percentage in diamond forecast and we are uh, going for the longer late time this it is uh, percentage is decreasing so i'm summarizing the result there is an uh, overall underestimation of the rainfall over land region of the west coast of india and overestimation in the northeast of india and uh, there is always an overall underestimation of the uh, extreme rainfall event in the both the models and uh, gfs model was forecasted 80 percent 85 percentage of the observed extreme rainfall event in heavy rainfall or above category in uh, South Peninsula, Central India, and East and Northeast India in their diamond forecast. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any question? Oh. 
Dr. Johnny? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, in summary, you have written there uh, an uh, underestimation of rainfall over land region of west coast of India and over overestimation of rainfall over northeast region. Yes. yes. What could be the reason according to you? Exactly, I don't know the result. So, there uh, maybe if you are including the land data simulation system, those things it make a, it can improve. The, uh, generally, there is a dry bias is observed by most of the um, models over the Indian region. So exactly, I don't, I cannot tell the answer. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, so we can go to our next presenter, Dr. Ramratan. Hello. Yeah, uh, so. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Amrathan. Uh, currently, I'm working as a senior manager in uh, Climate Connect Technology. And uh, this work uh, is done uh, when, I work, uh, when I was working as a project scientist in uh, IMD Pune uh, before joining this uh, organization. And uh, this uh, work is mainly wind power uh, potential assessment of India using IMDA and ERA-5 reanalysis data. Now, as we know that uh, like renewable part, uh, renewable energy, it's uh, clean energy and uh, very less energy, it's very less amount of pollution generated when we are uh, using renewable energy. So the objective of uh, this uh, work is to compare and contrast the wind power potential of India using IMDA and ERA-5 reanalysis data set. So basically we want to check uh, the, that our NCMWRFP uh, reanalysis data how much it's uh, better or worse compared to uh, era 5 okay so basically we are comparing to reanalysis data okay so the data which we have used for this study is uh, like imda and era 5 and imda data uh, we know that the resolution is around 0.12 to uh, into 0.12 degree uh, this and temporal resolution is 3 hourly and era 5 uh, is uh, like almost 0.25 to 0.5 degree spatial resolution but it is the it is in early estimates okay so uh, we have uh, taken data from 1985 to 2019 uh, so roughly 35 uh, years of data we have taken uh, okay can you go to the next slide sir yeah so uh, <clears throat> the methodology which we use is uh, wind speed is calculated from u and v wind at 1000 hp level so uh, square root of uh, u square plus v square if you do uh, that will give us wind speed and from this wind speed uh, like uh, the power uh, we calculate using half rho a capital v cube so in this one uh, the power is uh, directly proportional to the area of uh, wind turbine and uh, it is uh, like third power of uh, wind velocity okay so that means if we are having a error of uh, two in getting wind velocity wrong that means in the power we are getting eight times uh, like power uh, wrong so uh, if we uh, calculate it wpd that is uh, power per unit area that will be half rho v cube so again it's uh, proportional to power three of wind velocity so uh, we have uh, taken both these data set and uh, if you see this figure one uh, it is wind power potential uh, sorry i have written it as wind speed it's wind power potential so the color code in this one the uh, the the darkest color is around 500 uh, wind power potential wind power density and the lowest is around uh, zero so more than 100 to 150 it's uh, it can be harvested uh, or, or roughly 200 if it is uh, like mean for yearly that can be harvested so what we can see is throughout the like this is this time showing for uh, four months so jgs month so what we we can see that the upper part uh, in this one is uh, b is for july so for july uh, we can get the maximum wind potential uh, from imda and era 5 uh, both these data set okay and then if we calculate uh, the monthly wind speed uh, departure uh, between imda and era uh, so, in, so what I've done is IMDA minus ERA divided by ERA in percentage term. So the red curve is uh, the red part in the spatial pattern in the figure two is, is the, the reason where uh, IMDA is overestimating the wind power potential. Okay. And the blue is where it's underestimating. So now since both are uh, real analysis data, so we can't say which uh, data is better. So for that, uh, we got observational data from National Institute of Wind Energy for two locations, the one hour Ratutikorn and the other hour uh, Kanyakumari. For these two stations, uh, in figure three, you can see that uh, in this one, uh, we have used IMDA for these point location, ERA-5 for that point location, and the observation data. So uh, what we can see is uh, that the red curve, which is uh, that uh, red and blue curve, 
So Imda and Ira, they are quite nearby throughout the uh, like in the monsoon season, pre-monsoon season, as well as in the post-monsoon season. The same uh, we can see in the next part also, uh, Kanyakumari also, like uh, blue and red, they are nearby. So uh, uh, exactly what we got is that uh, our state of art uh, Imda data, it is uh, good compared to the observational uh, part. So compared to Ira 5. So since ERA-5 is uh, like uh, widely used in, uh, uh, in the global, in, in many parts of the world for uh, these analysis. So what we find is that uh, our IMDA data is also very good and that we can use uh, for many purposes. So like here I'm use, uh, using it for wind speed. So the conclusion of uh, this overall is that higher wind speeds are observed in the western state of Gujarat and Rajasthan uh, from both IMDA and ERA-5 data sets. And the wind speed is found to be maximum in the month of uh, monsoon months and it is in the, in the monsoon months also it's maximum in the july part and the seasonal pattern of wind power density matches in both imda and era 5 uh, data sets and imda overall or estimate uh, the wind power potential as well as the wind speed uh, compared to uh, era 5 uh, and uh, also if we see uh, we come, if we compare it with the observational part what we can see uh, as i already mentioned that uh, imda is uh, very much uh, matching with the uh, observational part so these are the basic uh, conclusion uh, which we have brought from the study. So thank you very much. And if there is any question, I uh, will okay, be happy. Thank to you. Go. Any question? No. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ramratan. Thank you. Okay. So we can go to our next presenter, Dr. Bushar. So uh, good morning, all. So the title of my presentation is Extended Range Forecast of Onset of Southwind Monsoon Over India Using Coupled Model. So in this presentation, uh, we are, I'm discussing about the operational capability of real-time forecast of onset of Indian monsoon in the extended range. So for this purpose, I, am, I have used the extended range forecast uh, that is uh, operational at uh, India Meteorological Department. And I have used 17 years of data from uh, 2003 to 2019 for the analysis. Next slide. So this is the, uh, the uh, left top uh, figure shows the uh, structure of the IMD's operational extended range forecast system. So as of now, we are having 16 uh, ensemble members, which runs for 32 days in every week. For these studies, I have used the, the parameters I have used is the rainfall averaged over uh, near to the Kerala coast in the Arabian Sea and the zonal wind at 850 HPA wind averaged over the Arabian Sea region and the zonal wind at 600 HPA. So the condition I have used is, is that the, rain, the rainfall average is exceeds the 80 percentage of their mean and zonal wind at 50 HPA if it exceeds the 70 percentage of their mean and the zonal wind, wind if, if it exceeds zero, which means when it, when it convert, converts to westerly. So on that day, we uh, I consider as an onset of monsoon and the condition is another condition is that uh, if three if all three conditions is satisfied for. Uh, consecutive five days, then the first day is considered as the onset of the monsoon. So for this purposes, I have used the initial condition of the 15th May and I did analysis for uh, 17 years. The right top figure shows the uh, evolution of the onset of the monsoon and the uh, predicted and observed onset I have uh, tabled here. If you look into the table, we can see the the, uh, the green color I have shown is that the uh, is, is, is showing uh, if the predicted one is closely matching with the observed one. So in the, in the summary, I have uh, the result indicates that the real time year of the capability of the predicted onset of monsoon objectively about two, two to three weeks in advance. So from the result, about 70 per, 77 percentage of the cases are closely matches with the observed dates on the onset of monsoon over Kerala. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bushar. Any question from anyone? Yeah, I, I, I have sir, one thing. Sir, please, please, sir. So, this color, what is the color? Yellow and green, red, miss. Sir, uh, this yellow, this green color shows that if the observed and predicted one is closely matching with the, if the predicted one is closely matching with the observed one, that is plus or minus three. If the deviation is plus or minus okay. three, it is mentioned in the green color. And if it is uh, plus or minus four, it is in the uh, yellow. And if it is higher than four, then it is uh, represented in the red color so uh, from the result what we have seen is that the uh, 77 percentage of the cases are coming under the green color 
that we observed in the 2003 so uh, some some odd cases are there so in like 2003 and 2010 and 2016 and 2000 can, can i add to his answer yes, Actually, sir. i remember 2003 because it was delayed there is influence of cyclone particularly over the bay of bengal during that period okay. that's what it was, i wanted to it, it, it was recurve so that has actually caused the delay but probably the model could give the rainfall so it was not able to detect which is whether it is monsoon or some cyclone influence that may be the reason actually these are the year where it is not matching we need to examine more detail yes, okay sir. you said you can do that one also the red okay. thing na yes sir you can clearly see why it has failed so region we can find out okay sir that, that we will do that we'll study we'll extend the study yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you dr busher so we can go to our next presenter whether dr vikram raj is available no dr ashutosh no. so our next presenter will be miss nandini yeah please uh, please start Uh, good morning uh, i'm nandini i'm i'm currently doing phd in iit bhubaneswar so today i'm going to present our work on the amplification of arabian sea aerosol monsoon relationship during el nino so the main objective of the work was to explore uh, how the relationship between aerosol loading over arabian sea and central rainfall is changing during different phases of enso and to analyze uh, if there is any regional selectivity in the dust induced rainfall enhancement the next So uh, it was observed that on weekly time scales there exists a positive correlation between aerosol loading over Arabian Sea and Central Indian rainfall, which is mainly attributed to the desert dust aerosols, which is being transported from the West Asian deserts. And uh, it is known that both the uh, emission and transport of dust from the West Asian deserts and the rainfall in India is modulated by the large scale oscillation and so. So next. So uh, we analyzed how the uh, rainfall over India and uh, air. during our arabian sea is changing during different phase of enso so during el nino we know that uh, india is generally receiving deficit rainfall so at that time uh, act the aerosol loading over arabian sea was found to be higher and during la nina when there is a surplus rainfall over india the both the aod and ai values over arabian sea was found to be comparatively lower so uh, basically in having contrasting effect on the aerosol loading over arabian sea and the central indian rainfall so chances are there that the observed correlation between the uh, aod over arabian sea and central indian rainfall may weaken when these large scale oscillations are prominent over india next uh, but interestingly it was observed that uh, the correlation exists and is significant during all phases of enso and the correlation is basically following the aerosol loading conditions over arabian sea but the highest correlation uh, observed during el nino followed by mel and lanina so it is clear that uh, whenever there is an enhancement in the aerosol loading over arabian sea uh, there is a in an enhancement as rain in rainfall which is basically leading to the strengthening of the observed correlation next so we uh, analyzed how the uh, during high aerosol loading condition uh, the wind speed is changing over arabian sea so contours are showing the climatological wind speed uh, which the climate the high winds over arabian sea which is generally concentrated around 5 5 to 15 degree north and 50 to 60 degree east was found to be shifting northeastward towards indian region during high aerosol loading condition the color bars are showing anomalies during high aod next and uh, this shift towards indian main 
at us in enhancing the moisture transport and it can be seen that the enhanced moisture transport is widespread across the arabian sea and the central indian region next and this uh, uh, shifting of winds and the enhanced moisture transport over arabian sea is uh, thereby leading to an increased rainfall so uh, many studies have uh, have been showing different regions where this dust induced rainfall enhancement is more so it is clear that uh, the dust induced rainfall and in, there is widespread increase all over india and the highest uh, enhancement is observed over central india northwest region and along the uh, western ghats region next uh, so it is clear that the uh, correlation between aerosol loading over Arabian Sea and Central Indian rainfall exists and is robust during all phases of ENSO and there is no specific regional selectivity in the dust induced rainfall enhancement. We clearly see that there is widespread increase over India with largest enhancement over the North, Northwest and Central Indian region. And uh, in the future warming scenarios, it is expected that the El Nino like conditions and the emission and transport of dust towards the Arabian Sea from the West Asian dust West Asian deserts are likely to increase, which makes this uh, dust induced rainfall enhancement more significant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Luska, I any, have... any, any question? Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, please, sir. Okay. So, um, this is a very interesting the aerosol loading influencing monsoon rainfall over central India. Okay. Do you have any yes, particular year that uh, has happened strongly? Uh, no, like, like we haven't analyzed in uh, separately for years. This analysis we have done from for the period 1981 to 2013. So, like, no. this is already established actually that this positive correlation exists. I, I am interested to know that 2009 case, 2009 okay. June, it was uh, many papers indicated. So, whether you have uh, analyzed that event, that was my main purpose. No, no, sir, we haven't analyzed separately. We will look into it actually. Thank yeah. you for looking. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? From anyone else? No. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nandini. Thank you, sir. So we can go to our next presenter, Mr. Anandu Rajiv. Hi, yes, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, like, uh, I'm myself, Anandu Rajiv, and I'm doing, a, a, I'm working as a research fellow in the Indian Institute of Technology Foundation. So today, uh, my presentation, presentation is on the uh, on the long term trend in rainfall during various season, like a case study over India. So we all know that the uh, rainfall occurring in our India is in the recent times. Uh, so how this rainfall is changing, and how this extreme rainfall is uh, changing over time is like it's critical for agricultural uh, planning as well as the situation. Uh, so our objective of this paper is to explore the long term trend in uh, rainfall during various seasons, like a payment soon, months soon, and post months seasons. Uh, also to find out how extreme rainfall is contributing to this uh, changing rainfall pattern and also to locate uh, the regions which is having a significant change in rainfall as well as uh, extreme rain. So, uh, so first we looked at how long, uh, how rainfall is changing uh, in a uh, long time. Like we have taken the data from 1979 and 2019 IMD rainfall data. And uh, uh, from here, like in, in the long term trend in rainfall data and how the contribution of this rainfall to annual rainfall is changing, we looked at it. So we can uh, find out that uh, during the payment season, the southern India is. And uh, when we looked at the contribution also, we can see, uh, found out that uh, this change is actually significant over the southern region during the pre monsoon season. And uh, when we looked at the monsoon, uh, monsoon, monsoon season, we can find out that the uh, northwest region as well as the uh, West Coast is uh, showing more uh, predominant change uh, in the long rainfall as well as the extreme rainfall as well. So when we looked at the post season, like in the east to coast, mostly like uh, the Odisha and Kolkata region are uh, showing increase in the uh, rainfall pattern, and uh, as well as like that, uh, the contribution of rainfall to annual mean also we can see that there is an increase. And uh, so how extreme rainfall is contributing to this? So we looked at extreme rainfall. So to find out the extreme rainfall, we used uh, uh, like 95 percentage. So whenever the rainfall is more than 95 percentage, we consider as extreme rainfall. So also, uh, we looked at the trend of the uh, trend of how extreme rainfall is changing. Also, like uh, how extreme rainfall contribution and the lot of rainfall is changing for the same time period of 1970 and 2019. So we can see that here we can see that the extreme rainfall is showing a similar pattern as that of the rainfall pattern that the region, like in the post monsoon uh, season and the pre monsoon season, the southern India which is showing a Increasing trend uh, in the rainfall pattern, also showing an increasing trend in the extreme rainfall. 
uh, like in the like also the west coast and north coast region uh, also showing an increasing trend during the monsoon season uh, and uh, in the east coast uh, mainly odisha and kolkata region is showing an increasing really increasing trend in the extreme rain so now like how to uh, how the extreme days are uh, to look at it uh, we found out that the days which is uh, greater than any uh, days uh, which is having the rainfall greater than any percent there we considered it as extreme day and we uh, plotted it for uh, like different seasons like uh, pre monsoon monsoon and post monsoon so here also we can see that uh, this is also having a similar picture as that of the uh, rainfall patterns like uh, during the pre monsoon season the southern india is showing an increasing trend and in monsoon uh, monsoon season the west coast is showing an increasing trend and uh, during the uh, post monsoon season the east coast mostly odisha and kolkata region is uh, showing an increasing trend so in the summary we found out that the uh, trends are like temporarily and especially heterogeneous and the uh, regions uh, which is showing a significant increase in rainfall pattern during various seasons is also showing a similar trend in extreme rainfall as well also when we looked at the extreme days we found out that it is also shows a similar pattern as that of extreme rainfall that is the region which is high, uh, which is having higher rain rate also has more number of extreme days that's it. thank you sir. hello Okay, yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Any any question from anyone? No. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Next, we can go to uh, Miss Manali. Ah, uh, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Manali Shah from Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, ISRO, Dehradun. And the title of my work is Evaluation of the Indian Summer Monsoon under the Influence of Climate Change. And the objective of the paper is Evaluation of the Numerical Models in Capturing the Structure of Indian Summer Monsoon During the Historical Time Period and Investigation of Changes in the ISM System Due to Variable Warming. Next slide, please. Okay, the data I have used uh, in this study is uh, ERA-5 reanalysis sea surface temperature and precipitation data with a special resolution of 0 0.25 degree to cross 0 0.25 degree from for the study period of 1980 to 2014, which is of 35 years. And the six climate data, historical simulation data from 1980 to 2014, 35 years of data. And future warming scenario data, which is uh, socioeconomic pathway uh, 245 from 2000. 65 to 2100 and the day uh, the methodology is that we will take the uh, climate model output for warming scenarios and we will see the future warming experiment experiment ssv 245 and uh, see the status uh, special platter and its statistical significance and go for the final results and conclusion the uh, taylor diagram analysis of sea surface temperature sh shows that the in the arabian sea it is showing the correlation of uh, almost 0 0.8 and the precipitation of uh, around uh, 0 0.5 which is uh, thus we can see the uh, uh, for the 12 climate couple models we can uh, say that these models are able to capture the uh, indian summer monsoon so we will go for the future simulation and the, for the spatial distribution of precipitation, we can see that the models are uh, giving us a trend, uh, increasing trend in of the rainfall for, for northeastern Himalayas region and the Western Ghat region. And uh, all of the models almost capture the same phenomenon. And uh, the uh, black stipples are showing is showing the significant location of uh, the changes at 95% confidence interval and the uh, apart from a few models like NESM3 and CSM2 WSCCM almost all the model captured the strengthening of uh, the uh, rainfall at western ghats and northeastern himalayas so i'll uh, derive some important conclusion from the study that the comparison of the semester model considered in the study with the observational data shows era 5 positive correlation of the order of 0 0.7 and in the context of future warming scenarios most of the models show significant trend of summer monsoon rainfall over the in over the western ghats and the northeastern himalayas and therefore the analysis of the uh, inner summer monsoon shows insignificant change in the backdrop of global warming and future warming scenarios thank you so much okay thank you any question from anyone no okay thank you miss manali
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We can go to our next presenter, Miss Minu. Miss Minu. Yes, sir. Oh, please. Oh, please. Good afternoon, all. I am Meenu and I am presently working as a DRF at IATM Pune. Today I am going to present observational atmospheric vertical structure of a core monsoon zone in central India. Our objective is to study the vertical structure of turbulence over Bhopal which is located in a core monsoon zone in central India. For this study we use 10 years of uh, GPS RS radio sonde data and uh, we know that the monsoon core zone is uh, characterized by the interest seasonal monsoon variation of active and rate. So in this study, we uh, explore differences in VST and other parameters during active and rate phases of monsoon. Next slide, please. So uh, in the, for studying turbulence, we use a parameter called C in square, which is called refractive index structure parameters, which is dependent on the temperature, humidity, and pressure profile in the atmosphere. The uh, figure shows, uh, the color plot shows the VST uh, using daily mean uh, climatology over Bhopal and we can see that there exists a high time and uh, height variation of CN square with higher values at the surface. The higher values at the surface is, uh, can be attributed to the planetary boundary layer and it's a, a planetary boundary layer and we can see that there exists a, a, a clear transition between monsoon and non-monsoon months. The uh, the region between the two red lines shows a monsoon season and we can see that there's a clear uh, difference between monsoon and non-monsoon months. The most important feature is the presence of a weakest turbulence zone which is centered at around 14 kilometers and we can see that uh, even before the monsoon onset it, uh, it started occurring and this uh, weakest turbulence zone is conspicuously seen only during the monsoon season. And also at lower heights, we can see that there is an elevated levels of higher turbulence values, even up to seven kilometers. And the other notable feature is the presence of a secondary maximum between 17 and 20 kilometers. And we can see that it persists throughout the year. And this, um, the turbulence is mainly due to the presence of thermodynamic and dynamic features. And this feature at 17 to 20 kilometers uh, due to the presence of uh, uh, dynamic features that is if, uh, during the non-monsoon months it is due to the upper flange of uh, subtropical westerlies and during the monsoon months it is due to the presence of uh, lower flange of tropical easterly just it, so we know that the monsoon is uh, 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 is characterized by the wind reversal so the dynamic factor is responsible for the secondary maximum layer between 17 and 20 and the weakest turbulence zone which is centered at around 14 uh, kilometers is due to the presence of higher cold cloud fractions around that height and uh, we also we can uh, we notice that the monsoon season is more homogeneous in nature compared to the other season so uh, to uh, to further explore uh, more about the intra seasonal uh, variation of uh, monsoon we have uh, studied the active and break days with active, uh, we have uh, analyzed 174 active and uh, 78 break days. And we notice that there exists uh, differences of turbulence between active and break. With uh, the, the first noticeable difference is uh, around this weakest turbulence zone at 14 kilometers. And also below, um, below uh, that height, we can see the difference in active and break, uh, break phase. With uh, below for five kilometers, there is uh, during active phase there is uh, increased turbulence, and the other high we can see the, the turbulence is uh, lower than uh, active phase. So uh, this factor, this particular uh, uh, vertical structure is mainly affected by the uh, gradient in relative humidity, temperature, and dynamic features. So further uh, looking into the more uh, features, the second uh, plot in the lower panel shows. Uh, the fractional cloud cover obtained from reanalysis data and we can see that there is a, a clear difference between active and break uh, uh, cloud cover with active region uh, showing more uh, cloud cover compared to break and this uh, difference in uh, uh, cloud cover at 14 kilometers that is higher cold cloud fraction is responsible for the difference in turbulence at this height and at the lower heights we can uh, the third plot shows the gradient in uh, bold uh, line shows a gradient in relative humidity and the other uh, just relative humidity and we can see that there is a clear difference between active and break uh, phase relative humidity gradients 
and this uh, this uh, uh, feature combined with the difference in relative uh, difference in gradient in temperature is responsible for the uh, particularly observed uh, vst during active and break next slide please So this is the this is your left this is the this is your left slide. Thank you. Next Thank slide. You. Uh, uh. So any question? So any question? See, tell me next slide. Do you have? See, tell me next slide. Do you have? No, no. Right side. Yeah. Right side. Some more of it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Continue. Continue, please. Continue. Continue, please. Yes. Uh, so summarize we can see that the cn square profile values are from the range of minus 18 to minus 12 meter raised to minus 2 by 3 and we can see that the early signature of weakest turbulent band is noticed even before the onset of monsoon and monsoon season vst seem to be more homogeneous and the higher cold flow fraction is responsible for the weak turbulent zone and active and break show also uh, break show significant differences in cn square profile and the strong uh, Thermodynamic and dynamic factors are responsible for the observed VST. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any question? Any question? No, no. So if there is no so question, there is no question. Thank you, Miss Men. Thank you, Miss Men. Yes, sir. Thank you. So our next presenter is Miss Basundara. She is available. No. Mr. Subrato Alder? Uh, yes, sir. Let me share the screen. Okay. It is not with admin? Uh, no, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Subrata Haldar, PhD scholar from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. I am going to present the study on decadal variability of monsoon core zone rainfall. And our objective of the paper is to study the decadal variability of monsoon core zone rainfall and its association with sea surface temperature variability. And the observation data used are ERSST version 5, precipitation data are used uh, University of Delaware GPCC and IMD 0.25 by 0.25 uh, degree. And uh, here uh, techniques are used spectrum analysis, wavelet analysis, bandpass filter, correlation and composite analysis. Here we can see from IMD data set uh, the uh, filtered uh, standard deviation of uh, rainfall and we can see it is more over the western cut and after that over the monsoon core zone region. So, we have we have shown this uh, variability of western cut uh, rainfall uh, in our previous paper and now we are going to discuss about the uh, variability of monsoon core zone rainfall uh, in decadal time scale. Uh, so, here is the uh, 31 year running correlation of filtered monsoon core zone uh, index uh, with different filtered SST indices. And here we can see the throughout the time period, uh, the, um, the relation between the monsoon core zone rainfall and the other SST, uh, global SST indices uh, is changed throughout the time period. And the most uh, prominent uh, change uh, is the uh, interdecadal precipitation oscillation and the Nino 3.4 SST, uh, SST uh, which, is, which was uh, negative through uh, 1901 to 1948. And, uh, and it is uh, in recent period, uh, the relation uh, is uh, positive. And so we, we went uh, with the composite analysis of summer monsoon uh, uh, sea surface uh, temperature during summer monsoon. So, uh, and uh, here we can see that uh, during period one, uh, the uh, um, uh, the IPO and uh, IPO was uh, negatively related uh, with the uh, monsoon core zone rainfall. And, uh, and after that, uh, in the second period, the relation is uh, uh, reduced. And in recent period, uh, the relation uh, 
is uh, more prominent uh, and the relation is po positive with a monsoon corrosion region and in the second period here uh, we can see that uh, trop uh, uh, tropical indian ocean uh, sea surface temperature that basin mode uh, uh, variability uh, is positively correlated with uh, the uh, monsoon corrosion rainfall and uh, our conclusion is that decadal variability in rainfall over the mcj display time varying relationship uh, with dominant sst mode and also from the dynamical and thermodynamical processes uh, study we have observed that the during uh, period one the dynamical uh, processes uh, was uh, more uh, more related with the uh, monsoon corrosion rainfall variability and during second and third period uh, the monsoon um, uh, related moist thermodynamics uh, was responsible for this variability and uh, uh, for future study, uh, for, for detailed mechanism of uh, this variability, we have to uh, go for uh, coupled modeling. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any question? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Subroto. Thank you, sir. Our next presenter is Ms. Priyanka. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Kushar, could you please zoom in, please? Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, Kushar, could you please zoom in uh, slightly? Thank you. So, uh, sir, today I'm going to present my work, which is... Uh, block-level weather forecast-based agro-advisory and its impact for Bihar. So, uh, in the present work, rainfall forecast of GFST-1534 model, which is available at 12.5 km resolution, process at block level is verified with block-level observation of East Champaran, Nalanda, and Sukhoi district of Bihar for monsoon 2020 and 21. So, why we have selected these three districts only? Because these three districts belong to the agroclimatic zone of Bihar, where uh, ACZ is uh, the zonation, uh, where uh, the area has been divided on the basis of climate, soil, agriculture practices, and crop grown. So uh, the study on these three areas only could uh, be able to represent the agriculture scenario of Bihar. So the uh, further after the verification, we have studied the impact of weather forecast based AAS, which is Agromet Advisory Services, uh, which are provided under the GKMS scheme of IMD. So, uh, and what is the impact of these services uh, on in the these three districts as well as in the Bihar? So under the GKMS scheme, as we know, uh, based on the five days weather forecast, we provide the AA, uh, agromet advisory for the farmers of about all the districts of Bihar and almost all the districts of Bihar, uh, all the blocks also uh, we are covering. So once we go to the data part, the data I have used in the study is the 12.5-kilometer uh, resolution forecast of provided by IMD, which is GFS-T1534 model forecast. And the observed data I have collected from the Bihar government, which is block-level AWS data uh, procured on, uh, with, uh, observed under the Meghdoot scheme of government of Bihar. The feedback study I have conducted with the help of the units. We have a network of 12 units in the Bihar. With the help of these units, I have uh, conducted, the, conducted the feedback study uh, for the AS services as well as the weather forecast provided. So uh, for the methodolo uh, methodology part, the verification has been done based on the standard method uh, recommended by WWRPWGEN, which is a 2 by 2 contingency table. And I have calculated ratio score uh, the probability of detection HK score as well as the false alarm ratio for these three district forecast. For the representation purpose of the verification part, uh, what I have done here, I have uh, I have um, divided the 65 blocks in the percent area. Uh, as we can see in the graph, the uh, in case of ratio score, I have also uh, get, uh, categorized the scale, uh, scale which is a 0 to 1 into uh, 3 score. Low is less than 0.5, medium is 0.5 to 0.75, and high is more than 0.75. As we can see, in case of ratio score, 75 to 80 per 5 percent of the area, that is 65 block, falls under the medium score. 
uh, 10 to 15 percent of the area falls in the low, whereas uh, 5 to 10 percent area indicates the high uh, percent of the uh, high uh, skill score for the ratio score. Uh, we can also uh, see here the performance of uh, uh, monsoon 2020 forecast is slightly better than that of the monsoon 2021 forecast. And also as we uh, move towards the D, uh, day one to D, day five up to day three, we have the good agreement of forecast, whereas it's slightly less than in that of the D4 and day five case. Uh, when we come to the HK score, the medium uh, that is 65 to 80 percent of the area falls in the medium uh, category uh, that is less than 0.25 and more than 0.25 we have 5 to 25 percent of the area. Uh, in that case also the performance of 2020 is better than that of the 21 forecast. Similarly, for POD, we have found that 90 to 95 percent of the area have the high POD score that is more than 75 percent and 50 to 75 percent uh, we found in 0 to 5 percent of the area. So in case of the PAD, uh, we found that uh, we have a good agreement of focus verification. And uh, for FAR, we have uh, 5 to 10 percent of the area in the low, uh, uh, low category, which is uh, more than 0.5. Medium, we have 70 to 90 percent, which is 0.3 to 0.5. And in case of high, that is less than 0.3, we have 10 to 15 percent of the area. So uh, in both, in all these scores, we have five, uh, we also found that uh, the forecast score of 2020 is performing slightly better than that of the 21 forecast. So uh, spatial verification, I have also tried to uh, do. In that case, I have found that uh, though uh, more than 60, uh, means we found more than 60 percent of the ratio score in almost all the blocks but in case of two blocks of nalanda and one block of champaran which is acre garage and asthavan and in case of star champaran it is pipra Futhi, the performance is quite low uh, and i have found with the local sources that in case of these two districts uh, because of the local activity, the rainfall occurs. Uh, uh, rainfall occurs sometimes, and in case of Pipra Puthi, there was a problem in AWS. So we, uh, we in and all, we found that the ratio score is uh, almost 60% for almost all the blocks. Similarly, HK score is also performing well, except these three uh, points where uh, which I have already mentioned. So. Uh, Further, the, uh, this uh, feedback study, so uh, we uh, have conducted two types of feedback here, dynamic feedback, which we used to take after in weekly interval by almost all the units. They, uh, they targeted 30 far farmers of their area and took the weekly feedback from uh, their, uh, these farmers based on their AS performance as well as the forecast performance. So, and in the case uh, of monsoon 2020, uh, in the end of monsoon 2020, we have performed the end of season feedback also for about 100 farmers. So, this is my summary. Uh, the forecast part I have already uh, uh, covered. And uh, the, we have found that accuracy of the forecast were found good up to three days and subsequently decreasing. However, uh, in the bi weekly agreement advisory, what we do, we update the advisory on every Tuesday and Friday. So, being updated on every three days, the good accuracy forecast only came into the picture. And in case of block level analysis of the forecast, I have, I have already discussed the, these three points uh, were the uh, problematic point and uh, the, uh, which has been already discussed. And uh, once we came to the feedback analysis, it indicates that advisories are highly useful for the farmers and they follow the advisory particularly for sowing, irrigation, fertilizer application and harvesting operation prior information of rainfall and extreme event emergence uh, uh, extreme event events are significant requirement of the farm farmers and more than 70 percent of the farmers are satisfied with the forecast so uh, there is one more thing that i have performed the categorical uh, this uh, uh, quantitative forecast verification also and it is found that uh, the model is not able to uh, uh, capture the high rainfall event and in case of the feedback, we have found that most of the farmers are required the uh, information of high rainfall forecast only. So this is the gap area which I have found that we have to work upon these things also. So where we can use the now cost product and other products 
to uh, uh, meet the farmer's requirement. So this is all from my study, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Priyanka. Any, any question? Ms. Priyanka, I want to know that whether you have considered any manual observatory or all the all AWS data only. Sir, in this case, I have considered the AWS only. So these are quality check data? Or... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any question from anyone? Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next presenter, Mr. Benugopal, whether he is present. Mr. Benugopal, no. Dr. Sapana Sasane, no. Mr. Vikram Raj. Mr. Ashutosh, okay. so with this, we came to an end of this session, poster and oral, short oral presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks. Uh, you. Hello, sir. Yes. So I'm Vasundara Balde. My presentation is uh, remaining. But you, you didn't respond. Yeah, 21, you didn't respond. Uh, Okay, please start. ID number 21, sir. Yeah. Dr. Busher, do you have that presentation? Yeah, please. Uh, hello. Uh, today's the topic of my presentation is projection of uh, Indian monsoon sparse zone shift under climate change. The uh, identify the monsoon sparse zone, track its shift, and to provide the future projection for it. Then the data. I'm the daily rainfall data for 100 and 116 years from 1901 to 2016. That is also used and uh, to uh, identify the monsoon sparse zone at the Met calculated the rainfall for each Met uh, meteorological subdivision. And after that, I divide the rainfall years into normal year and negative normal year. Based on that, uh, uh, I have Number of excess rainfall year and number of positive normal rainfall years are less than the deficit rainfall year, and the number of negative then the meteorological subdivision experience lesser rainfall than its long term mean. When three or more than uh, sub come under the which I uh, shown in the uh, flow chart, then that uh, region is uh, called as term. So it is found that uh, the Indian summer monsoon variability is uh, important for social uh, social aspect as well as so earlier temporal variability of Indian summer monsoon rainfall has been studied extensively. However, the spatial temporal variability of area is uh, getting less attention. For that, that uh, monsoon sparse zone is uh, give the information where. To observe when the, uh, mo there is a mo monsoon sparse zone, the number of uh, deficit rainfall year. So the uh, with, uh, term that uh, region as the mo MSZ monsoon sparse zone. The MSZ shows the shift in India in the past century. After that, uh, uh, the 21 years running correlation is also checked. In for SST, Arabian Sea SST, it is found that the uh, Pacific decadal oscillation SST and strong negative oscillation with MSZ locals. For the future projection, uh, I use Cordex. Uh, uh, 
डॉक्टर सपना मिस्टर विक्रम राज मिस्टर आशुतोष मिस्टर वेणुगोपाल नो थैंक यू थैंक्स टू ऑल द प्रेजेंटर फॉर नाइसली प्रेजेंटिंग एंड कंप्लीटिंग विद इन टाइम दो so now over to patnak sir uh, yeah, i i really really very thankful to dr laskar uh, kindly yeah, because just see uh, we are just finishing in time so that is more important and okay few were missing but uh, overall we have got good number of presentation uh, as in 16 15 16 it is good and uh, those who could not make presentation uh, there of uh, this uh, pdf and uh, video will be available if they have submitted or if today somebody has missed like to present tomorrow also there can be some missing person tomorrow so that we can also will explore if you, if you can convey it in well in advance so i with this thing i uh, we are uh, this for noon session today we are closing and thank to all the cha chair dr raskar and all the speakers so we will again reassemble at uh, hall a for the invited talk in the afternoon session that is at 6 uh, 6 pm that is our uh, 1230 utc so till that time bye for now thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you everybody